you know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million who's taking my hand. Got a million better put on the road. I just win. I know we got a million dollars. The devil that's it and I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the second part of What If Naruto Joins Avatar Last Airbender. Special note, this fanfic is written in a masterpiece of Blutus Mindpretzel on fanfiction.net. Do check and support the author too. Now smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. Staring out over his kingdom from the highest point of his palace, Fire Lord Ozai looked down at every single piece of the capital with spiteful eyes. What of it he wouldn't trade to have this over and done with? Since taking the title of Fire Lord and continuing his family's conquest of the world's nations, he had been forced to make sacrifices, a great many of them, to ensure that peace could finally be forced and satisfied. His distancing from his own humanity had been beneficial in keeping emotion from presenting itself as a stark weakness that he had seen rule over the decisions of many an unsuccessful leader. But this this was something he still didn't know if he could do. The ritual had been clear in its requirements no matter how many translators he had brought on and threatened harsh punishment on for reading incorrectly. But they had all stammered the same inescapable truth. Grandfather I don't know if I have the strength. This sentiment rotted in his head miserably. Ozai already had prepared himself for what was to come and he was ready to face whatever pain this might bring, if the resulting consequences were as overwhelmingly advantageous as they promised to be. He would do what he must, to do what even his own heartless father had apparently warned away as being too steep a cost. Azulin had locked away this secret, clearly confident that the sheer power Sazen's comet granted on its own would be enough to secure victory for the Fire Nation. But Ozai was no longer sure of this. The Avatar had managed to survive to this point and it had already been established that invasion of the Fire Nation from a joint effort was possible. And above all else, the very idea of the Avatar state was enough to instill apprehension on its own. Ozai had heard from his both his spies and from his scholars how devastating this transformation could be. In this form, the Avatar would be quite literally unstoppable, even with the advent of Sazen's comet drawing near. If the Fire Lord made his move on that day, the Avatar state would likely meet him in the flesh, and then decades upon decades of planning would have been for naught. And so it came down to this, the way to use Sazen's Comet in an entirely new sense, a method that may very well allow Ozai the ability to suppress the Avatar state. And all it required was one last sacrifice, one last cost that could guarantee ultimate success. The price was so simple, it was rather unbelievable. And part of Ozai wished that he indeed couldn't believe it. Behind him, a servant approached and bowed deeply. Your Highness, Princess Azula's airship has been confirmed on approach. Our estimates place her arrival at about dusk. Ozai dismissed the update with a wave and the servant retreated, leaving the Fire Lord to be alone again with his thoughts. The morning sun beat down on him like the molten hands of some wicked clock, reminding him of what was to come. He stood atop his tower for well over another hour before turning to re-enter his palace, leaving all doubt and all trepidation behind him. As he descended the stairs, he once again threw off the invisible shroud that was his humanity, that loathsome and heavy burden that did nothing but cause trouble to those in power. His own self-assurance blossomed with every step and he found himself smiling before he knew it. After all, there could be nothing of more value than the greater good. Sasuke sat around the fire that made up the center of the Avatar's camp, occasionally dipping into the meal that had been provided for him while he tried to ignore the endless odd expressions that were directed his way. Katara, Toph and Zuko had all ceased in attacking him for the reason he now understood as they believed him to be some sort of modern miracle, and he had been ushered down to their camp to try and straighten out some likely very heavy notions. Sasuke had cast the briefest Jinjutsu on Ong and found that the kid was telling the truth, and since he now had somehow been led right to the person he was expecting to take weeks trying to find, he knew he had no reason to deny this conversation. Trust was going to be a very fickle thing in this new world, but he had to start somewhere. He could have done without their constant staring though, with just under a dozen people fixing him with hardly blinking expressions. He wouldn't deny feeling unnerved. So, let me get this straight, he said slowly, after taking another bite of his supper, you're all ready to tear my head off for getting rough with Aum. And after I shut down a few of your attacks, you're no longer interested in turning me into a bloody stain. 
Toph, who hadn't uncrossed her arms since they sat down, snorted and blew some strands of hair out of her face. Don't think I haven't quite yet disqualified that option, freak. Katara's expression hadn't changed in the slightest from when she was attacking him, to sitting across from him now. At any moment, he wouldn't have been surprised if she instigated a rematch, but when she spoke there was a reserved calm in her voice. No one has been able to bend more than a single element for as long as recorded history has been taken down, save for the Avatar. You just showed us something that everyone on the planet would call an impossibility. Popping a slice of cheese into his mouth, Sasuke held up a hand. I need someone to explain this bending to me. As he saw incredulous looks passed amongst the small group, he realized that what he had done would likely have been the equivalent of performing a great fireball jutsu from where he was from and then promptly asking what a jutsu was. Where I'm from where am I from? His aggravation began to resurface and he shook it aside, as he clarified, where I come from, it's not called that, and I need to know as much as I can about the energy flow you possess in this universe, what allows for this bending as well as what can be done with it. Katara looked around as if to see if anyone was willing to provide an appropriate answer, but as she opened her mouth to likely delve into an explanation, her father beat her to the punch, Sasuke noticed the slight aggravation that seemed to pass over her face as he did so. Bending of the elements is an ability that is inherited by people of the four nations. Some are born without this gift, but the ones who are so lucky find that they are capable of harnessing one of the four elements to their will. Skill and efficiency depend on experience, practice and the energy one is able and willing to exert. For example, if Toph here were wanting to bend a slab of earth to try and smack you clean off this temple, it would be to her like swatting a fly, given her overall ability and experience. Cracking her knuckles like lightning, Toph grinned, gladly, sparing a consternated look at the girl. Hakoda continued, but if she were to try and cave in this entire section of the temple, it would put a great strain on her and regardless of whether or not she was able to, she would be left exhausted afterwards. Toph's smile was wiped off her face and she muttered something about show you exhausted. Zuko spoke up for the first time since they had ventured to steal an airship. Each of the four elements are classified to each one of the four nations. If you're born of fire nation blood and are a bender, you will be able to harness fire. Same idea for the other three. Sasuke ran his eyes carefully over each of them in turn, and no one, save for this avatar, can channel any more than one of these bending techniques. Ong nodded at him before raising a hand, palm up. A small bit of water from Chitsang's glass rose up alongside some dirt from beneath their feet. Both elements rose to swirl above Ong's hand, a sphere of air whirling around them and lastly, a small orb of fire appeared in the very center of the spectacle. For a moment, earth, water, air and fire hung in a suspended state, dancing amongst one another before the fire puffed out, the air flow ceased, and the water and dirt fell back to earth. Looking down at the puddle that had collected at his feet as a result of his little show, Ong looked terribly lonely for a moment. My people were all wiped out when the Fire Nation learned that the Avatar had been reincarnated as an airbender. Sasuke raised an eyebrow, reincarnated. Seeming to remember where he was, Ong's miserable expression disappeared and he cleared his throat. Sasuke caught Katara looking at him with a deeply sympathetic look on her face as he continued. Yeah, when the an Avatar passes on, the essence of the Avatar is reincarnated in another bender. This time, it just happened to be me. His anguished expression returned. I found out who I was and what I was going to have to do, and it was too much for me. I ran away with Appa. Appa? Sasuke asked. Sokka gesticulated with his hands to charade something large and flying. The flying bison we mentioned. Thoroughly bemused by the thought of a flying bison, Sasuke opted to put this aside for the moment. Ah. Uh, he gestured at Ong who carried on. We got caught in a storm and crashed in the ocean. We probably would have died, but I was able to freeze us in it a hundred years before I woke up and found I was the last airbender. This was something Sasuke had to raise a hand at. I'm sorry, a hundred years. Sokka dropped a hand on Ong's shoulder and shook him in a rough, but friendly way. Yep, me and my sister found him on accident while we were fishing one day. And now, almost a year later, here we are, at the climax of perhaps the most destructive war ever fought. He gave a laugh that sounded almost manic before trailing off and narrowing his eyes at Sasuke. The hand that had been on Ong's shoulder rose up to point accusingly. All right, Mr. Mystery, time for you to give some answers of your own. You come walking in here and just show that you can bend not one, not two, but three elements in. Pulling from his jagged memory bank of techniques, Sasuke raised a hand in the same fashion Ong had. Focusing a small portion of his chakra, he generated a sphere of air in his palm that swirled and howled quietly before gently flicking the racing in at the wall behind the group where it impacted the stone heavily, 
leaving a small crater in its wake. Sasuke somehow knew that the racing in he had just utilized was someone else's technique and his employment of it was nothing more than a copy. But at the redoubled expressions of shock directed his way, he figured his point had been made. Sokka practically had to close his mouth which had fallen open to add in a voice of sheer disbelief, okay. Four elements, Zuko was eyeing Sasuke with an expression of pure distrust. Who are you really? Feeling a tinge of impatience, Sasuke replied bluntly, If I knew, I wouldn't be here right now. He decided to relate the other piece of the story he had left out of the equation. It was entirely possible they would all consider him a lunatic for saying it, but he knew what he had seen. Just before I broke out of my holding level, I was visited by I guess what you could call a spirit. Katara raised her eyebrows at him, a telling expression of what she thought. A spirit. He nodded. Tall, blue and transparent, long white hair and beard. He noticed Ong perk up at the description. He told me that he wasn't sure how he was able to commune with me, but that my search for answers would become much more clear if I found the Avatar and aided him in his journey. He told me that if the Fire Lord was defeated, I would be able to pursue my quest freely. Ong leaned towards him, looking as though Sasuke had just said something vitally important. This old man, did he have an ornamental hairpiece? Sasuke nodded. Ong's eyes began to widen. And was he wearing ceremonial robes? I suppose so. Ong got to his feet so quickly, he nearly tipped Sokka off his seat. But with a flick of Toph's finger, a stone pillar rose from the ground to right the unbalanced young man. That must have been Avatar Roku. I thought you just said the Avatar could only be one person at a time. Seeming to be too excited by this news to stand still, Ong began to pace back and forth in front of the fire. I know, that's true, but the spirits of the avatars of old have communed with me before. When I enter the spirit world, I'm able to talk with them, hold whole conversations. He appeared to realize something and looked at Sasuke as though something had been spoiled for him. How were you able to talk to him? Sasuke shrugged and leaned back. Trust me, he did most of the talking and it wasn't for very long but he was clear to mention he wasn't sure how it was possible that I was able to see him. It was this avatar Roku who reminded me of my name. The young earthbender known as Haru looked hesitant to speak, but asked anyway, What what do you remember? Wishing terribly that he could give a better answer, both to them and himself, Sasuke looked at the ground. Very little. Things come and go like names and faces, but they are there and gone like a blink of an eye. The only things that seem to be solidly retained are techniques, jutsu, as I know them to be. He raised his hand again and summoned Chidori. Lightning crackled around his hand and wrist violently and several members of the group recoiled before he banished the jutsu. I remember these techniques and how to use them, but I've found that they seem to wear on he greater than they did wherever I was before. I don't remember how exactly I know this, but when I fought Azula and Mai, using jutsu seemed to wear me down more than they should have. Ong gave him a hopeful shrug. Maybe that'll come back to you, like I'm sure your memories will. Sasuke laced his fingers and rested his face against them, muttering sullenly, they'd better. There was a pause before Suki leaned in to add a thought of her own. You seem to be pretty handsy with the warden back in the gondola, like you thought he knew something. Was anything he said indicative of some potential answers? Thankful for the reminder, Sasuke closed his eyes, trying hard to think. There was when I was paralyzed and confined. He brought a new penal officer to show me off to. He said several things that he claimed to all be rumor passed along the soldiers from the Fire Nation capital all the way to the prison. But I suppose it happens to be my best lead. Hakoda brought a hand up to stroke his chin thoughtfully. And what exactly did he say? Anything that seemed even the slightest bit familiar. Eyes still closed, Sasuke drove his fingers into his temples. Yes, I don't know how, but he mentioned that I had stepped into this world from within Sazen's temple near the capital, directly in the presence of the Fire Lord. He heard several surprised inhales and some soft murmuring before Zuko snapped, You appeared to my father, and he didn't kill you. Several blurry images and words were beginning to resonate in his head, as he quietly replied, I remember nearly nothing of it at all, but the warden relayed that he believed I was of enough interest to send to the prison rather than having killed. It was. Sasuke began to remember something in sequence very vaguely. I remember seeming to almost be looking in at the temple through a glass wall, like I was there, but not. I could I could see who must have been the Fire Lord talking with some priests, or something who said, If you are certain, your highness, if you truly intend to perform the ritual of Sazen's rites, we will confer with the other scholars and ensure the steps are as we believe them to be. They are few, but if your highness, behind you. Sasuk snapped his eyes open as his memory became a rush of heat and flame overtook everything else. Ritual of Sazen's rites. That's all I remember before I awoke in the prison. Someone was telling the Fire Lord about this ritual and how they were going to make sure its steps were accurate. 
No one seemed to react to these words with any particular emotion and Sasuke believed that perhaps this information was hardly anything of real consequence before Zuko rose jerkily to his feet. Katara looked at him inquisitively. Zuko, what is it? Zuko's face had paled badly and he looked rather as though he were about to be sick. He turned to look at Haru with somewhat wild eyes. You said there was a library here, with historical practices of all four nations. Haru nodded, looking perplexed by the expression Zuko was giving him. Yeah, if you go down that set of stairs, it's down the fourth hall on the right and then up that set of stairs. I think the traditions and practices section was on left section. Without a reply, Zuko had already taken off in the direction he had been pointed towards. Everyone watched him run as though he had the entire world chasing him as he disappeared into the temple. Toph turned her head in the direction he had run off in. Anyone know what's up with him? Katara continued to stare at the doorway Zuko had disappeared into with a look of concern. I don't know but if the Fire Lord is up to something else beyond just using the power of Sazen's Comet that might not bode well. Sokka rubbed his face tiredly. Yeah, like we weren't already at a huge disadvantage. Less than two weeks to go, and we're still in a hole and Ong hasn't even mastered firebending yet. Pushing aside his own frustration at not being able to remember more than a single chunk of dialogue, Sasuke sighed and sat up straight. All right, so what's the plan? The tension returned to him and Ong asked, plan. Sasuke nodded. Yeah, plan. I've been told my best course of action is to help you throw down this fire lord, and I intend to do so. An uncomfortable silence fell over the group and Sasuke began to realize that even if he had stumbled across the very person he had wanted to meet, his second goal was starting to feel a little less than achievable. What do you think this is about? Lai looked over at Tai Li who had been staring out at Azula alongside her over the past hour as midday had come. She wouldn't have denied that she had looked over to the princess a fair few times, but Tai Li had been watching her as observantly as a hawk. Mai feigned a lack of interest as she examined her fingernails. Who knows, her father might have had something particularly urgent come up that he needed Azula for. Fingers roped tightly around the handrail in front of the large window. Tai Li continued looking out the window nervously. More important than sending her after the Avatar. He knows she's the one with the best chance of success, and he trusts her more than any of his generals or operatives. My side. I don't know what to tell you other than that it has to be pretty important. She resumed her act of appearing entirely uninterested in the proceedings before she noticed that Tai Li was now looking resolutely at her. What happened at the prison? Turning to look at her friend, Mai knew that even her mastery of apathy wouldn't get her out of this line of questioning. Even as she asked pointlessly, What do you mean? Tai Li gave her an aggravated look. Don't bullshit me, Mai. I know the both of you have done a good job of covering it up since it happened, but the looks on your faces when I showed up are something I'll never forget. When Mai didn't answer, Tai Li scooted along the railing and grabbed her wrist gently. Mai looked over to see her friend's eyes were pleading. Please, that guy did something to you both. I don't think there's anyone on the planet save for the Fire Lord himself that you two couldn't take down together. But not only does he slide past you both and get to me, he leaves you two looking like you'd seen ghosts. Turning around to look out at where Azula had been standing poker straight for the past hour, my side. It was something she had been spending a lot of time thinking from the moment she had awoken from it, though always in the back of her mind, as though calling it forward would be too damaging to her psyche. But Tai Li deserved her honesty, and chances are, she wouldn't get a straight reply from Azula. I'm genuinely not sure. He must have got us with some drug, some toxin that made us hallucinate and knocked us out. I don't know about Azula, but I saw things. They were too real, too vivid to be a dream though. I truly can't describe to you what it was like. I really thought they were happening until I woke up next to Azula and realized they had all been in my head. Tai Li inched closer still. What things did you see? Mai tried to deflect. Bad things. Come on, Mai. What did you see? Tilting her head back to look at the roof of the front cabin of the airship, Mai steeled herself. She had thought of them once already when they had first boarded their vessel and had locked herself in her room for a few minutes to cry and not be seen. She didn't want to look weak in front of anyone, especially not Tai Li or Azula, and she convinced herself that she wouldn't cry now. I saw you, Azula, Zuko, my family. You were all being tortured. Badly. I couldn't do anything except sit there and watch. I tried begging with whoever was doing it, but there was no one to plead with, nobody but that guy. But he was standing next to me, not actually doing any of it. Every whip that cracked, every hot poker that was jabbed, there was never any real figure doing it. Just masses of shadow whose faces I couldn't see. I went to the prisoner then. I went on my knees and I cried and offered him anything if he would just stop this and leave you all alone. 
but he just stared at me with those damned eyes. I swear they were red and black, with shapes inside them, and I couldn't look away. I just... Hey, hey, my. It's okay. As she felt Ty Lee's hand wrap around her shoulder, Mai realized that despite herself, she had begun to ramp up to talk in an almost frenzied panic almost out of her control. There were no tears fortunately, but her brief loss of control were probably enough to indicate how bad she had been rattled. Taking in a deep breath to calm herself, she looked down at her hands which were clutching the railing just as Ty Lee's had moments ago. I'll never get just how real it was. I know people have been able to concoct some absolutely crazy drugs in the past several decades, but how this was able to create such a vivid scene. It was like he had orchestrated it himself, down to the wire. Everything was placed by him. Everything I saw and felt were only consequences of his choices. She let her voice dip down in its register as she muttered darkly, When I see him again, I'm going to make him tell me how he did it. However I have to force him, I'll know what he did. There was a pause as Ty Lee rested her head on Mai's shoulder who, though she would never admit it, relished the feeling of comfort it gave. I doubt Azula told you what she saw when. When what? The both of them jumped away from each other as the sharp voice of Azula cut through the cabin that had previously only been occupied by the both of them. She must have walked in unnoticed while they were talking and was now staring at them expectantly, clearly waiting for an answer. When I saw what? In an act of quick thinking that surprised Mai, Ty Lee shrugged and finished. When you looked at the summons from your father, it looked like there was more to it than the soldier said. Narrowing her eyes, Azula frowned. There was nothing more than his demands I returned to the capital at once. It's not anyone's place, not mine, nor either of yours, to question why he would request my presence. She marched towards the door that would lead towards the captain's quarters and wrenched open the metal door. Before she stepped through, she paused a moment and looked back with intense eyes. And I'd rather you two wouldn't theorize behind my back when it isn't your place to do so. The door slammed shut behind her and Ty Lee jumped again. Mai leaned back on the railing blowing out a sigh of relief. Not bad. Ty Lee shrugged again and turned to look back out towards the open blue sky overshadowed by their airship's great mass. It's actually pretty easy, especially when everyone just assumes you're an airhead who couldn't even comprehend lying. They spent a long several seconds looking out, shoulder to shoulder before Mai added in a low voice, I don't know what she saw. Though I imagine if it was a drug or something to make someone see their worst fears or something, it would have its work cut out for it. She looked over her shoulder at the doorway Azula had walked through, feeling a pang of sadness in her heart as she wished violently that she was wrong in saying, I don't know if she really has anything she'd be hurt over losing. Katara was the first to see Zuko as he came staggering back over towards the fire looking perhaps worse than when he had left. He stumped weakly over to his seat and dropped down back on it, a heavy and ancient looking book in his hand that he set down beside him. Sokka leaned back and forth in his spot before cocking his head and asking, well, what's the verdict? For a moment, Zuko only shook his head, looking truly lost before he nudged the book with his toe. Katara couldn't have imagined him looking any more defeated. When Sasuk mentioned a ritual of Sazen's rites, I had to know for sure. He rested his head in his hands, looking as though he were trying very hard to come to terms with something. When I was younger, I learned about a bunch of rituals and practices that my great-grandfather and those before him had instilled as last resorts, final techniques to fall back on if all else failed. There was one like the burning interlude, which supposedly created a giant firestorm at the cost of many sacrificed lives, or the blackened something that was supposed to turn the oceans to fire or something like that. Sokka shook his head in a sharp rattling movement while holding up his hands. Whoa, whoa, I'm sorry. What? Zuko nodded weakly. I know, they sound crazy. And none of them were tried to my knowledge at least from Sazen onward. There was this sense that not only were they too radical, but that they wouldn't work anyway. But when I heard that name, he sighed. I knew I had heard it before. And I knew that this temple, if it had a documentation on old traditions of other nations, it might list this one. Silence fell before Ong finally asked quietly. What's your dad going to try and do? As though unable to summarize himself, Zuko lifted the sizable text onto his lap and opened to a page he had marked. Though the particulars of this specific ritual are largely unknown and based purely in Fire Nation text, at the cost of sacrificing a familial bond, a strong firebender might be able to harness power from Sazen's comet itself, drawing on its strength to procure a powerful and permanent gain in ability. He slammed the book shut and showed it angrily off his lap where it hit the ground with a thud. Katara felt her heart begin to gently pound a constant beat as she considered what this could mean. Sokka didn't wait to ponder the same. What kind of gain? What does it mean by familial bond? Giving a short cry of distress, Zuko got to his feet and walked briskly away. 
Katara watched him ascend the steps where the airship had landed and he leaned against the pillar that overlooked the canyon, head bowed, joining the collective and watching the agonized young man. Katara finally looked to her father who gave her a firm nod. Standing herself, Katara walked over to the large set of stairs and began to ascend them. She felt, more than saw, Ong, Sokka and Toph following close behind her. When they reached the plateau, Katara did a double take as she saw Zuko's shoulders heaving gently. She never would have imagined him breaking down quite like this. Hey, Zuko, we won't let him get to you, you know. Toph's calm tone reminded Katara that she too could speak, and she nodded in consent. She's right. We're all here for you. We could even hide you away until after the comet passes. Zuko whirled on them and the wet streaks that coursed down his face confirmed what his silent shaking had meant. You don't get it. I'm not scared of my father or what he might do to me. I. He choked off and looked away again. You wouldn't understand. Ong stepped up quietly behind him until he was only a few feet away. As gently as he dared, he put a hand on Zuko's back and Katara felt a warm feeling spreading in her gut. Help us too. Straightening his back, Zuko seemed to regain control of himself as he asked quietly, During all your journeying, all your travels, who was the one person other than me who managed to stay just behind you? This was an easy question and Katara replied for the good of them all. Your sister. Zuko nodded bitterly. That's right. My perfect sister who could do no wrong in the eyes of my father, who always did everything better than me who has always been able to track you guys down, and who was right there when we broke out of the prison and came back here. Sokka massaged his wrists uncomfortably. You lost me. Zuko waited for several seconds before replying. All that considered, there's no reason she shouldn't have descended out of the sky with a fleet of airships hours ago. As this sank in, Ong looked towards the ground. He's right. Azula should have been here by now. Sokka shrugged. I see that as a win, believe it or not. That psycho flamethrower being elsewhere and not here sounds pretty positive to me. Ong slowly turned his head to look at Katara as the pieces clicked together. They exchanged pained looks as it finally settled with Sokka what was likely going to happen. Oh man. Zuko sniffed a humorless laugh. Yeah. The five of them shared a long silence as they considered what Ozai was intending to do. Katara found herself breaking the silence, not sure how best to approach the situation. But knowing Zuko needed to hear some kind of anything, she spoke as gently as she could, Zuko, I'm sorry. He didn't say anything in reply. Then, Sokka being Sokka blundered over words that should have stayed thoughts. I mean, she did kind of try to kill us all a bunch of times and she zapped your uncle and has completely disavowed you as a brother. Toph snapped a punch into his side before he could dive any deeper down a path that shouldn't have been followed just then. He winced and looked over angrily, but as Katara sent him the best shut up or I'll walk over there and pull your tongue out look she could manage, he caught himself and settled on massaging his ribs. Zuko hadn't seemed to take offense at his words, however and he bowed his head in clear indecision. I know she's done wrong by all of us and maybe she shouldn't be forgiven for that but. He finally turned to look at them and the agony in his eyes was enough to push Katara over to him and she pulled him into a hug. Zuko choked out the rest into her shoulder as she felt him shake. She's my sister. Katara looked over his shoulder at Ong who looked terribly consternated himself, but she could tell his mind was doing gymnastics. He put his hands on his head and shrugged. Maybe I don't know, maybe we can. Sokka interrupted then, clearly not reserved any longer about speaking his piece. Oh, no. No, no, no. We are not going to try some insane stunt to save his psychopath sister. Ong put up his hands in a sign of surrender. Sokka, relax. I was just thinking out loud. Obviously unsure of how to reply to that, Sokka waved his hand spastically at Ong for a second before adding, Well, stop it. We do not need this kind of problem right now, not with how little time we have, and not with what's at stake. Katara pulled away from Zuko and he wiped his face on his sleeve. His voice was broken and quiet, but it spoke with a level of resolve that she remembered hearing from him more than once before. I don't want any of you risking yourselves for this but I have to try. At this, Katara found her tongue and moved from a hug to putting her hands on his shoulders, forcing him to look into her eyes. Zuko, no, that's not happening. He looked at her desperately. The capital is half the distance between here and Boiling Rock. I could make it in time and warn her. Ong came up beside Katara and gave Zuko a pained look. She'd never believe you and you would be captured or killed. An angry fire began to grow in his eyes then and he looked to Katara. So what? I have to try. Didn't I stand beside you when you felt you had no choice in finding the man who killed your mother? Feeling her throat tighten, Katara was relieved when Ong spoke on her behalf. That was different. He was just a common farmer that you hunted down on your own accord. This would be a suicide mission for any one of us. Toph walked up quietly, her bare feet making hardly a sound. We need you here, Zuko. 
We lose you, we lose the only chance we have of teaching Ong firebending, and there go our chances of taking your darling dad down. He flicked his gaze between each of them, looking in a frenzy for any sort of sympathy with his plight. Katara could see him reach the moment where he knew that there was nothing he could say that would convince them and he grit his teeth and turned his back. I can't give up on her. Father I know has to be defeated, but you might not believe it, but I know there's hope in her. Katara found it a great relief that Sokka didn't snort in reply to that. Zuko continued, she's sacrificed every piece of herself, of her humanity in the belief that we as a nation have divine right over all. Something my grandfather and father tried to instill in both of us since before I can remember. She's fallen for that dream, and now she's about to die for it. He didn't turn around, but Katara watched as a tear hit the ground in front of his feet, soaking into it and expanding into a damp spot that glowed in the afternoon sun. Can't you understand that she and my uncle are all I have left? Even if she hates me forever, even if she never comes around I'll still fight for her. Genuinely amazed by his maturity, but seeing no recourse for the path he wanted to take, Katara lowered her head. A look at her companions told her that she wasn't alone in her problem. The four of them stood behind Zuko, wishing there was anything they could do to ease his pain, to try and achieve some compromise. But there is none. Clenching her fist, Katara stared at the ground as though demanding that the very dirt itself provide her a solution. Hell go. She spun on her heel as a voice that didn't belong to herself. Sokka, Ong or Toph resounded behind her. Sasuk was standing at the top of the stairs, leaning against another pillar with his arms crossed, looking as obstinately emotionless as he had since he arrived. Feeling no small amount of indignation, Katara took an angry step in his direction. Were you eavesdropping on us? He shrugged. Just listening. Sokka stepped up behind her, looking as angry as Katara felt. So, eavesdropping. He shrugged again and Katara felt her anger begin to bubble even further. How long were you standing there? Toph kicked the dirt absently, since Sokka turned his brain on and realized why this was upsetting Zuko so badly. Now Katara whirled on Toph who was looking thoroughly as though this were not that big of a deal. He was there that entire time and you didn't think to say. Sasuk took a step towards them. Don't get angry at her. Just trying to offer a solution. It was a long moment before Katara's anger subsided enough for her to even remember what that reason was. Behind her, she heard Zuko's voice rise up, still broken, but inquisitive now. You'd do what? Sighing, Sasuk rubbed the handle of his sword absently. I'll take a trip over to your dad's house and either warn your sister away from the highest form of corporal punishment, or force her out of there if I have to. Hardly able to believe what she was hearing, Sokka spoke her piece for her, oh, yeah. And in what universe do you find it a good idea to risk yourself for a favor to someone you barely know? To save someone who's done nothing but try and kill you on your only encounter? Sasuke's eyes were unreadable black pits as he replied flatly. The only lead I have on recovering who and what I am is to help the Avatar. The Avatar needs to beat the Fire Lord. The Fire Lord only gets beat if, as you say, the Avatar learns firebending on top of the other three forms. Inclining his head towards Zuko, he finished, and if this feckless, emotionally stunted bastard gets himself killed before doing his due diligence and teaching Ong, that sets my own plans back a bit. Pacing a few steps back and forth, Sasuke spoke as matter-of-factly as if talking to a group of toddlers who were arguing over a snow fort. Katara felt her disdain for him growing by the minute. So, the only way I see it is Zuko is only going to keep his nose out of this business if his sister is given a fighting chance. I'll go and be that bearer of bad news if you stay put and do your damn job. Any other time, Katara would have expected to see Zuko fly off the hinge at a verbal abusing like that. But as she turned to see his reply to this proposal, she saw only pain and the barest glimmer of hope in his eyes. Sokka took an arrogant step towards Sasuke, crossing his arms in mock. And what makes you think you have any chance of getting past all those soldiers and guard to even reach Azula in the first place? Maybe you held her in my off before. But that could have been luck. Azula might have thought you were cute for all we know and went easy. Funny, said Sasuke without smiling, but I will be able to reach her. I'll man the airship and conjure up a nice headwind for myself. Infiltrating the capital won't be problem. I have that figured already. And as for anyone who gets in my way... His eyes crossed over Katara's for a moment and she felt a sudden chill run up her spine before Sasuke twitched. It was a subtle movement, one she might have missed if she hadn't been looking at him when he did move. But the next thing she knew, he wasn't standing there anymore. I'm not in whatever state I was when the Fire Lord and his minions got the best of me. Katara uttered a short scream as she heard his voice just behind her and she spun again, instinctively gathering a small collection of water from the air temple's basin just down the stone steps and forming it into a tight hammer of liquid. 
he remained where he had moved himself to, standing back to back with her. She realized that if he hadn't spoken, she never would have noticed that he was just behind her. Turning slowly, Sasuke regarded them with an unblinking, challenging stare. Now are you going to give me directions, or are we going to do this again? Doing a last check over the make of the small airship and its instruments, Sasuke looked out over the long grassy plain that he and his vessel were alighted on. Beneath him was the massive and expansive temple, though he would never have guessed its existence if he hadn't been down there just minutes ago. The sun beat down on him with a firm warmth as the blue sky beckoned to him and he prepared to board. Zuko had taken him on a short spin up top to familiarize him with how to fly it. The others following closely on the flying bison which Sasuke had been surprised to see was exactly as they had described it. After placing it down on the grass, there had been a short bout of awkward goodbyes. Sasuke had only known them for a matter of hours, save for Sokka who he had escaped this prison with the previous afternoon. It was clear that his sister had no time for his attitude, or his manners and had not dismounted the beast Sasuke now knew to be called Appa, and had remained on his saddle, not looking in his direction. Sokka too seemed to have lost the warmth he had initially spared Sasuke, and regarded him with suspicious looks and offered him the barest wish of luck before scooting away. Ong was a different story and Sasuke could tell the kid's range of emotions towards him were vast. There must have been a part of him that wanted to like him, another part that was warning of distrust, and another still that found him too dangerous and unpredictable to trust or have around. All of this compounded with the fact that he clearly wanted Sasuke to succeed if only because of what it meant to Zuko. He had offered an awkward handshake and wished safe travels before turning jerkily to climb back aboard the bison. The girl known as Toph had seemed more indifferent to the situation which Sasuke had found odd, considering how antagonistic she had initially been towards him. Instead of a barrage of insults and remarks on how she hoped he might go down in the middle of the ocean, she gave him a short good luck and retreated to climb into the back of the bison's saddle. Zuko had been the last to leave Sasuke to his preparations and clearly had a great deal he wanted to say but couldn't find the words for. He had settled on a handshake as Ong had and murmured his thanks in a fumbling of words before turning around sharply to be the last to board Appa, and the bison had flown them back down into the ravine and to the temple. A good ten minutes later, Sasuke was confident he could pilot the small airship successfully and make good time. He had been given the estimate that the Fire Nation's capital would be about four hours west, but he was sure he could cut that down slightly. If all went well, he would be able to reach the capital by sunset. The airship was small, with a balloon only about the size of Appa and a basketed cabin beneath that could hold about seven or eight people without feeling too cramped. Sasuke climbed in and closed the hatch, double-checked his evening meal a last time to make sure it hadn't mysteriously disappeared and turned to the burner. Fire style, fireball jutsu, he said, and blew a sizable flame to reignite the burner and, disabling the anchors, the airship lurched from the grassy field and began to climb into the sky. After a period of ascension, Sasuke walked to the back of the ship and looked for a place to lie down and doze. With the sealing technique he had cast, he had every assurance that his craft would maintain a current course for the capital, and the first real Fire Nation military outpost was at least an hour away. That was just enough time to get a little shut-eye and mentally prepare for when. So, Jutsu, huh? Snarling, Sasuke whirled with his sharing and prepared to let loose at the intruder. Toph was leaning over the central metal box that composed the burner, looking at the rising fire, as much as a blind person could look. Zuko just has to move around like a monkey with ants eating at its privates to generate anything crazy. But you get a full fire going with just a few words. Turning to see how easy it would be to turn around and drop the stowaway off, Sasuke gave her an annoyed glance he knew she couldn't see. What exactly do you think you're doing? She shrugged and dropped onto the floor where she spread herself out like a lethargic starfish. Few things. Coming along is one of them. Making sure you do what you promised is another. Adjusting the controls that dealt with the airship's height, Sasuke listened to her ramble on behind him. I mean, if we're being frank here, nobody trusts you, not even Ong and he's usually pretty easy to win over. I don't think anyone has quite come around to the fact that you're a complete freak as far as bending is concerned. And I'm betting with all that, no one even really thought to think about the fact that you just straight up left. Preparing to turn the ship around, Sasuke replied offhandedly, As long as Zuko stays put and works on that training, I don't care what anyone thinks. Topher seemed to think about this before snapping at him quickly as the airship began to turn. Don't even think about taking me back. I've made up my mind to come along and keep an eye on you. Proverbially anyway. He didn't answer and she walked up behind him. No one knows I left and no one's going to go missing me for a while. I said I was going into the temple to practice and look around. No one's going to notice I'm gone for a long time. Sasuke didn't reply still, 
but jumped as Toph punched him in the rear. Hey, are you listening to me? I'm not ready to risk my life sneaking into the capital, not to mention my absolute hatred of heights just to have you try and ditch me. Glaring at her, Sasuk growled, hatred of heights, hum. The air was permeated then by a scream from Toph who found herself very quickly being dangled over the side of the floating vessel by her ankle. Gripping her tightly, Sasuk watched her struggle for a moment with satisfaction as her tune quickly changed. Hey, 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 I'm sorry, look, I wasn't trying to imply anything, this was just a whim. Peering over the side of the airship that was now close to approaching the first layer of clouds, Sasuk looked back to the girl he was currently suspending several thousand feet in the air. Hard to imagine how high up we are, isn't it? When you can't see, we could be ten feet, or ten thousand feet. Care to take a guess? She groaned and struggled against him further, arms flailing to try and find purchase anywhere. Sasuke continued, Maybe on the ground, you're some kind of big name. But no earth and no sight make you look pretty hopeless to me. Let me go. You sure you want that? He loosened his grip on her ankle just long enough for her to feel the lack of control, and Toph screamed again. Sasuke closed his eyes and thought for a moment. It was stupid of him to not have looked around the entire burner box to make sure that no one had been there. But with the reaction he had received, it had been the furthest thing from his mind that anyone would try and tag along. And now he had this girl insisting she come along for no other reason than to make sure he kept his word to Zuko. He had only barely began to turn his vessel, and bringing her back would zap away about an hour of his time. The canyon that the air temple was sewn into was just a slight jagged cut on the horizon now. Sighing as logic dictated his course, he lifted Toph back around and dropped her. She had time for a last scream as she fell a total of about a foot before landing on the floor of the basket in a heap. Sasuke made sure his voice was firm and incontestable. You'll come along and you'll do as I say. He turned to redirect their course and she repeated behind him as she picked herself off the floor, I'll come along and I'll do as I say. Briefly stunned by her immediate return to disobedience, Sasuk turned to see her already waving her hand in submission. Don't worry, freak, I won't cause trouble. Watching her a moment longer, Sasuk finished correcting their course and, after making sure they were still ascending at a soft but steady incline, he dropped down in the back of the airship's basket and laid back on his satchel of food and meager supplies. He was surprised when Toph walked over to sit down relatively close to him, something he wouldn't have expected considering their brief, yet troubled history. So, what's the plan? Closing his eyes, Sasuke replied back with an amount of snark worthy of Toph. The plan is a plan that I thought of and that I'm going to use when we get to the capital. She snorted, nice. Allowing himself a brief smile, Sasuke returned to trying to doze before Toph gave him a final surprise. Scooting herself in his direction, she laid her head down over his shins as she adjusted herself into a comfortable position of her own. Just in case you get any funny ideas and try to ditch me again. You're not going anywhere without me knowing about it. He stared back at her unseeing eyes for a moment before shrugging. Have it your way. Seeming to find lying on her back with the most comfortable use of her newfound leg pillow, Toph let out a sigh as the light breeze flowing past them tousled her hair. I'm not going to ask how you managed to make this ship go exactly where we need to. I'm guessing you have more up your sleeve than just cramping on Ong's style. I guess I'm just hoping you really do have a plan. Speaking his last words before drifting off, Sasuke did his best to not sound too malicious. Oh, I've got a plan, but you're going to absolutely hate it. He became exceptionally perplexed then at how guilty he felt for what he was going to do. Watching Zuko and Ong dance with all the ferocity and grace of the fire that swirled around them, Katara tried not to think about what had transpired earlier that day. Zuko, I'm so sorry. He appeared to have bought Sasuke's pretense of wanting to help but she knew better. Sasuke was long gone and wasn't coming back. He was going to find his own path to answers and it didn't involve helping Ong or Zuko. Katara only let him make off with their only other means of transportation because she wanted him gone. Worse than a liar, he was dangerous and had been glad to see him go. Sokka walked up alongside her to look out over the pair of them training. What are you thinking? Katara sighed, I feel bad for Zuko. Blowing out a long breath of his own, Sokka dropped down to sit next to her. Yeah, I can't believe I'm feeling bad for him considering this is Azula we're talking about. But the poor guy doesn't have much. Giving her brother a sideways glance, Katara clarified. I mean about trusting Sasuke. Blinking, Sokka nodded. Yeah, that too. Turning to fully face her brother, she looked over him carefully. You don't think he's actually going to try and make it to the capital, do you? Matter of factly, Sokka nodded again, more firmly. Yeah, I do. He returned her look with a sad smile. I just don't think he has a chance of actually getting done what Zuko is hoping for. Staring at her brother in utter bewilderment, Katara shook her head to enunciate her feeling. 
I don't believe this. You, who never trust anyone, are taking that guy at his word. Sokka stretched his legs and looked thoughtfully off towards nothing in particular. I'm not expecting you to understand, sis. Just a thing that I feel. He kept looking off and trailed on. When we first met Ong, I didn't believe a word of it. I felt the same way with just about everyone we ran into, not wanting to believe what I heard. And that was it, I didn't want to believe it. From behind them, Suki called out, Sokka, you coming? He waved an affirmative and stood up, giving Katara a last sheepish look. He said, you sound an awful lot like me, Katara. Maybe you just can't stand the idea of someone actually being willing to help us. And he ran off to join Suki, leaving Katara to watch the spectacle of flames put on by Zuko and Ong, wondering how in the world her brother could sound so smart and still be so wrong. Stepping off the ramp from her airship, Azula looked around at the capital that she had only departed yesterday. She would never lament being home, but the writhing resentment for her father's recall made the usual taste of seeing her city a bit sour. On her right, Tai Li looked towards the north sky, looking like it's going to storm. On her left Mai snapped back, Tai Li there hasn't been rain, let alone a storm over the capital in decades. The acrobat shrugged, looks awful black to me, allowing herself a moment to regard the dark clouds gathering on the horizon. Azula might have admitted at any other time that Tai Li looked like she could be right, but the storm would likely pass by the capital on its northwestern side as all storm fronts did. But she was in no mood to talk about the weather. I intend to get to the bottom of this immediately. Without a word, she began a brisk walk towards her father's palace. Mai and Tai Li in tow, she made it only halfway to the royal carriers before a high-ranking officer, flanked by a small squad of upper guard. He bowed low to her, Your Majesty, your father has sent me to collect you. She regarded him disdainfully. Obviously, I'm already on my way to see him however, consider your orders outdated. He looked perplexed at her chiding, but didn't move out of her way. Ah, yes, your highness, but... He informed me that this guard was to escort you personally to the palace. Raising an eyebrow, Azula gave him a look. As you can see, I already have an escort with my two right hands. Your men will not be necessary. He still didn't move. Fire Lord Ozai was quite insistent, your highness. Tai Li tugged at Azula's robes. It's alright, Zula. Jerking her arm free of her friend's grip, Azula stepped toward the captain of the guard and jutted her chin furiously in his direction. I highly suggest you don't try and find out which of us is more insistent. These two will be my accompanying guard to the palace, and if you speak another word, I'll have you thrown from Azulan's tower. This finally seemed enough to sway him, and he waved his guards back before standing back to let them pass, storming past him. Azula continued towards the royal carriers. Behind her, Tai Li spoke quietly. That was really sweet, Azula. Sniffing indifferently, the princess flicked a look back. Don't let it go your head. But as she entered her personal palanquin, she felt her frustration with the situation fade away ever so briefly as she looked back to see Mai and Tai Li offering her grateful smiles. She snapped her fingers and the two of them climbed into palanquins of their own and the small procession began towards the palace of her father. And as the afternoon grew dark at an unusually quick pace, thunder rolled in the distance. The head of palace security and captain of the guard reflected for the umpteenth time in the past hour how curious the present situation was. It was his duty and privilege and very distinct honor with safeguarding the massive ornate building that housed the fire lord himself, and until only just recently, he had managed to do everything necessary to fulfill that duty. But now, here he stood alongside the majority of his guard, vacated of the palace at the express order of none other than Fire Lord Ozai himself. So now the entirety of the royal guard was milling about the palace grounds until further notice, and the head of palace security was finding this less than flattering. It was almost as though he and his elite soldiers had been sent outside for recess as though they were children following school lunch. Worse than being unflattering, however, it felt distinctly off. Fire Lord Ozai had never been one to see the great need in explaining himself, but there was usually at least some semblance of reasoning behind his orders. And after the recent assault on the capital itself, security seemed of the utmost importance. Regardless, they had all been placed on temporary hold of their service until summoned by the Fire Lord's personal aid, meaning that save for perhaps some of his closest advisors, their leader was completely alone a prime target for Earth Nation assassins, or another joint attack or perhaps the Avatar himself making another appearance. All was enough to drive the captain of the guard a tad crazy as the possibilities rushed him. Sir, here they come. Glad to finally have something to focus his attention on that wasn't his own muted distress, the captain looked down the long winding set of broad steps to see three palanquins being brought up to their base. 
he had been alerted ahead of time that Princess Azula and her personal consorts were en route, and her highness was due for a meeting with her father. Could that be what this is all about? What sort of private matter with his daughter would make the Fire Lord paranoid enough to vacate the entire palace? Even from the distance that he stood, there was no mistaking Azula's striking figure stepping free of her palanquin where she was joined by the other two young women that she seemed to go everywhere with. As she began to ascend the stairs, he turned and began to walk a path around the palace grounds. His second-in-command eyed him as he did. Sir, there are already five patrols sweeping the grounds as per your orders. He continued without looking back, calling over his shoulder. I know, but I have no desire to be anywhere between Her Highness and whatever her destination. And he left it at that. The second-in-command stayed put a moment longer before glancing down the stairs. As she approached, it was clear in her movements that Azula was not in the finest mood. She rarely was, but even then, the soldier took the advice of his superior officer and took off as well. Sasuke, you are the one who will become my new light. You have my spare eye. From the day you were born into our clan, you have been unavoidably intertwined from this blood-soaked fight. Now come, my little brother. I shall kill you to obtain my true transformation. But with us, it's different. I'm always going to be there for you, even if it's as an obstacle to overcome. This is the true bond of the brothers of the Achiha. With a shout, Sasuke's eyes snapped open and he pulled himself into a sitting position from where he had been laying. The words he had heard in his dreams continued to thunder in his head like the gongs of some monstrous bell. Was that who was that? You're okay, freak. Bad dream. As the waking world became his reality, Sasuke looked up to see Toph leaning against the burner box, arms crossed and her blind gaze directed towards him. He licked his lips and breathed slow and calmly as his heartbeat slowed to a regular pace. Yeah, something like that. Looking skyward past the balloon of the airship, he blinked and then jumped to his feet. How long was I asleep? Toph shook some hair free from her face and sat down, clearly relieving herself of the duty she had taken while watching him sleep. Not sure, about two hours. The darkness of the sky caused Sasuke's heart to skip a beat, but he quickly realized why the blackening of the sky had occurred. Directly ahead of them was a colossal storm front. A wall of black clouds rose from several hundred feet above the ocean to disappear into the heavens. Whatever breeze had been softly flowing was gone now, the distinct and unmistakable reality of the calm before the storm. Toph seemed to have picked up on this and asked, It got pretty quiet while you were asleep. We're not in trouble, are we? Not yet. Looking down, Sasuk could see the distant flicker of the lights from what must have been the Fire Nation capital a sprawling city that culminated at its highest point with a building that even from that far off he could tell was a massive and impressive structure. We're close. The sudden nerves in Toph's voice were apparent as she replied to him quickly, We are. Not speaking back, Sasuke began preparations. He hadn't counted on a storm, but with the blue sky he had dozed off underneath being replaced with an encroaching storm, he would need to work fast if he wanted to still go through with his plan. Casting another fireball jutsu that sent the small airship on a tremendously quick ascension, he double-checked his limited gear and their trajectory. Assuring himself that everything was in order, he sat back down and pulled free an apple that had been provided to him as part of his provisions. Only then did he stop and actually listen to Toph who had been hounding him since he had started moving. I swear, if you actually flew us all the way out here without an actual plan I demand to know right now what you're thinking and what we're going to do, because I can't imagine that even you're stupid enough to just go park in front of the palace, walk inside and say hey, Azula, long time, no see, oh by the by, your dad is about to kill you to steal power from a comet, so fair warning unless you really are that stupid in which case was that thunder. As a distant rumbling sounded and Toph spun around like a schizophrenic owl, Sasuke reached up and grabbed her arm, gently but firmly. You're going to need to relax. Though he hadn't quite expected it, she did as he asked and inhaled deep gulps of air in an effort to keep herself stable. When he was convinced she was in a place where she would actually comprehend what he was saying, Sasuke began to talk, keeping the details as fluffy as he could. The best way into a city guarded like a fortress as far as I can tell, is from air. We'll go down just above the palace and land on the roof, or nearby, our inconspicuousness being rather important to that end. We'll use your earthbending to get inside, and from there, we hunt down Azula. This gave Toph pause and she turned in his direction. Wait, so part of this plan actually relies on me being here. It does now. She leapt into the air triumphantly. Yes, I knew it. Act all tough and loner, but you need help just like everyone else, you're not so bad. Another splintering crack of thunder sounded, this time much closer and louder, and Toph jumped again though this time not in jubilation. 
Sasuke looked towards the flickering black mass of cloud and found himself glad Toph was unable to see it and just how massive it was. You keep talking that way, and I'll throw you into this storm. She rotated angrily to face him. I knew it, that was thunder. Her elation entirely gone. She dropped down to sit on the floor of the airship's basket, wrapping her arms around her knees. A more intense wind had begun to interject itself over the prow of the vessel, and Sasuke finished his snack hurriedly before seizing the rope that served as his only other provision and began to tie it. Toph muttered from the floor of the basket. Stupid idea. Should have let him just go get killed by himself. Stupid asshole. Making me think it was a smart move to tag along. I should have. Looking out over the black storm, Sasuke looked over the edge of the airship which had started to begin swaying more in line with the desires of the wind. Beneath them was the distant dark gray of the ocean and just ahead of them was the capital. It would be close, but wait much longer and he was risking serious disaster. I'm leaving now. You want off, or do you want to get hit by lightning and die complaining? Toph squealed at his words, her voice cracking. You better not. She scrambled back up and raced up to the sound of his voice, colliding with him. If she had been much bigger, they might have both been knocked clean off the ship. Taking her shoulders to steady her, Sasuke asked, Do you want to be on my back or on my chest? Even in the darkening light of the evening sky, he could see her cheeks redden and he rolled his eyes, clarifying what he meant. I'm going to tie you to me. I'll be able to control us falling fairly well, but it will be much more of a chore, and more risky to try and do both of us separately. She turned her head upward at him. What do you mean falling? Aren't we landing? A strong gust of wind rocked the vessel, and Sasuke lied in the hopes of speeding this process up. That's what I meant. But the wind is going to get pretty strong and if we have to make a hard landing, I'll be able to keep us both together and safe. She waited almost long enough for Sasuke to yell at her before muttering, front. Lifting her and putting her arms around his neck, Sasuke took the rope and tied her as tightly as he could to his chest. Another crash of thunder and roar of wind sounded, and as Toph jumped against him at the sound, he knew it was time. Sorry, kid. Sitting on the railing of the airship, he tipped off backwards and fell into space. As the wind bellowed at him, the thunder rolling all about and Toph screaming to top it all off, he spoke a jutsu that he couldn't well hear over all the noise. Sound release, muffled echo. All at once, the sound around him dulled into a dampened and fuzzy sound that resounded low in his ears. Finding it much easier to think, Sasuke turned his body so that he was aimed headfirst towards the ocean. The storm seemed much larger and imposing than it had as though it had significantly gained speed since they first set eyes on it. The Fire Nation capital by comparison looking like a small display of a thousand tiny fireflies with an enormous, flickering black blanket swooping low to smother it. Keeping an arm wrapped around Toph, not trusting his knots in their entirety, Sasuke spoke again as his free hand went through several symbols. Wind release, vacuum current, as though they had hit an invisible chute. They turned in their fall, carried diagonally towards the capital at an excessively intense speed. Sasuke cast another jutsu to hopefully deter any freak lightning strikes from directing themselves towards him and Toph and within 30 seconds of their descent, the capital had grown exponentially in relative size. Toph had fortunately stopped screaming, but he could still feel her heart pounding against him. Don't worry, we're almost. As they soared above the capital and palace at about 2,000 feet, the world suddenly glowed very bright and Sasuke felt pain explode in his side as a fireball collided with it. His fall became free once more as the jutsu broke and he spun at the whim of the wind before correcting himself and returning to reality. The ground was bearing up on him awfully quickly and he shook away the burning tips of rope that flapped around him. Burning tips of rope. It was then, as he scanned beneath him relentlessly to see who might have attacked him, that he was absent a very particular weight. His eyes turned upward and he saw Toph falling 20 feet or so in front of him and about 10 feet beneath his descent. She appeared to either have passed out from the strike they had taken or from fear entirely and dropped as helplessly as a ragdoll might. Growling, Sasuke prepared to recast his wind-release jutsu to reach her and keep her from becoming a stain with attitude on the palace grounds. Another fireball flashed by him on his right and he twisted in midair to track its path. As raindrops splattered against him as hard as rocks, he saw what he had somehow missed during their descent. A Fire Nation airship of roughly the same size and make of the one he had just piloted over to the capital was steadily descending after them. It was slowly falling out of sight as it seemed unable to keep up with the rate Sasuke and Toph were falling. But not one to be without the last word, Sasuke pulled back an arm. Chidori, barking the word, he let the lightning sling from his wrist, a very abrasive blue color against the white flashes amongst the blackening sky. It arced to reach the airship and he watched it explode in a burst of electricity against the balloon portion of the vessel. 
As it spiraled uncontrollably towards the ground, Sasuke turned back to the situation at hand. Shit, was all he had time to think before his shoulder collided with an uppermost outcropping of the palace's highest tower, and blew it apart in a slew of rubble. As the pain seared at his limb, he realized that in the time it had taken him to turn, identify his target and attack, gravity had remained far from forgiving. He saw that Toph had miraculously avoided the same tower he had struck, but a quick glance down met him with a frightening realization. He would never get to her in time. There wasn't enough time as the roof of the palace was seconds away. Wind release wouldn't get her to him in time. She was going to die because he had put getting even over her. No I won't. Just as they were about to hit the roof at very near terminal velocity, a deep blue glow appeared from behind Sasuke. A snaking appendage, thin and with a massive hand to adversely complement its apparent wiriness, reached out and opened its palm beneath Toph, catching her even as the roof met Sasuke with a clattering smash. He opened his eyes to realize that not only was he seemingly fine, but he felt mostly unhurt, save for the pain in his shoulder. As rain hammered down around him, he stood slowly to see what seemed to be a cage of dark blue arcs circling him in a protective shield. The arm that stretched out gently deposited Toph on the top of the palace and Sasuke looked around at the ghostly apparition that had just come to his aid. Susanoo. Somehow, he knew that was what it was, though how it had suddenly been remembered as something he could utilize was another matter entirely. Regardless, he had more important matters to deal with. He raced over to Toph, the Susanoo disappearing as he did. A quick look over told him she hadn't been hurt badly, save for a burn where part of her sleeve had been torched away when they had been hit. A quick couple slaps across the face and she was slowly blinking her way back to reality. Well what happened? Where am I? Then as she must have remembered all that had happened, she leapt away from him and adopted a particularly angry stance. Sasuk straightened and stood back as the rain continued to lash them and lighting splintered the now entirely dark sky overhead. I cannot believe you. You just jumped out of the airship with me. She stomped her foot in an explosion of shingles and roof rushed towards Sasuke. Casting a quick substitution jutsu, he leapt away from her attack and cast another wind release that allowed him to hover above the ground. His sharing and had let him see that Toph's movements and attacks came from her sensory abilities that she gained by communing with the ground beneath her feet. Of all the people he had read around the fire back at the temple, she had been by far the most impressive, but it was still with relative ease that she could be countered. Sasuke watched as she clearly realized that he was no longer there and she spun about angrily, surely feeling through the roof with her powerful sense of touch, furiously keen to find him. Don't run away from me, you freak. When he remained silent, she cried out in frustration and sent a circular wave around her feet rushing out and tearing at the roof, rushing up in a cascade of hard bits and framework. It would have been a strong blow to anyone it might have hit, but Sasuke remained quietly out of reach and out of her only two senses that could detect him. He watched as she seemed to grow more and more upset. He intended to let her burn herself out, or put her to sleep if she wasted too much time, but something surprising happened. Toph continued to vent through her movements, flinging pieces of roof every which way, the sound of it muffled by the hammering of rain, claps of thunder and roar of the wind. Sasuke listened to her curse him, scream insults and do everything in her power to find her target, and introduce him to her wrath. It was after a dozen seconds or so of this behavior that Sasuke realized two things. First, she shook with a sudden spasm every time there was a boom of thunder. Second, her movements were less aggressive than they were desperate, as though something very important relied on her blowing him away. He heard distinct fear enter her voice after a while and then after a minute, without warning, she dropped to her knees and ceased attacking him altogether. And as he looked at her shake with fright and worry, Head bowed on the massive sprawling roof, Sasuke realized that all she really was, was scared. Her voice shook as she put her hands over ears, please don't go, don't leave me, I'm sorry. Had he been any weaker, Sasuke might have been overcome with pity. As it was, his mission never faded from his mind and he put himself down next to her. She didn't reach to him returning to a plane where she could sense him, and she barely moved when he knelt next to her and put an arm around her shoulder. I'm right here, you're all right. Words of comfort came from his mouth as though someone were pulling his teeth. Empathy, he found, came to him about as reliably as cold found itself in fire. For a moment, the world was lit up in a silent and brilliant flash of lightning and Sasuke put his hands over Toph's ears. But she still leapt as another boom, the loudest yet, shook the world around them. Taking his hands away, he leaned down to speak quietly in her ear. What do you say we get out of this storm? As though propelled purely by the idea of having something to do, Toph raised her head to give him a short nod. He stood up straight and she followed suit before bowing her head again, though he could tell it was for a purpose other than fear. 
After a second, she stomped her foot and Sasuke felt the roof beneath him give way, and he dropped down a circular hole that she had opened with her bending. He slid down a distance before they pair of them dropped into a massive hall, adorned on either side with pillars the width of a man lying on his back and lit by torch, glowing a dim, yet intense orange around them. The wall behind them silently opened to create hands of marble and stone, catching the pair of them to set them down silently in the shadowy corner of the great hall. As the hands retreated to become the wall they were originally purposed to be, Sasuke instinctively leaned out to look up and down the massive room, even up to the ceiling that disappeared into blackness over a hundred feet above them. Where alone, Toph remarked coldly as though she had read his mind. Sasuke looked back to her skeptically. Are you sure? As though personally insulted by him even asking, Toph reached out with her hands and drew up pieces of the floor, both nearly the size of Appa before flinging them across the length of the hall to land in the shadow of the other pillars, hardly visible then. But the almighty crash that followed caused Sasuke to stare in pain and grit his teeth. But as the noise echoed away and no one came running, he was forced to look back to Toph who had her arms crossed. You win. He had hoped his submission would spur her further, but she instead seemed to ignore him and lean back against the wall. In the shadows, he had trouble seeing her expression, but her aura practically seeped with her mood. Stepped up to lean on the wall beside her, he asked quietly, Are you going to be okay? She shrugged her shoulders and sighed, I just hate storms. Like, really badly. I got lost in my family's garden once when I was a kid and a storm blew in. Rain hitting the ground made feeling my way around through the earth really difficult, and the noise of it all made thinking impossible, except for remembering how alone I was in all of it. So, yeah, storms terrify me, laugh all you want. I'm not laughing. Toph scratched behind her ear. Yeah, you don't seem like the kind to laugh at much of anything. Standing alongside her a moment longer in the pure quiet of the enormous hall and listening to the distant rumble of thunder, Sasuke supposed that he ought to move this along surprised he didn't have to remind her of their reason for being there. She pushed away from the wall and started to walk further into the palace. He fell in line beside her as she asked, do me a favor and stop moving a second. He complied and she got on her hands and knees, palms open against the red carpeted floor. After a moment, she mused, weird. The place is almost totally empty. It's a lot harder to sense people when they're not moving, but I've got one down the hallway. Footfalls too heavy for a woman though. There's another too soft. Azula walks way more aggressively than that. As Toph muttered out her findings one after another, Sasuke couldn't help but be genuinely impressed over her control of her element. Her blindness had very clearly done nothing but enhance her growth and skill. Suddenly, she stood up straight and pointed at an angle towards what must have been another part of the palace. There, about a dozen hallways away, three sets of footsteps. Are you sure she's one of them? Toph smiled. One set is almost dragging her feet, like she'd rather by lying down than walking about. Another set is almost bouncing around. And the third is marching with the authority of someone who thinks a great deal of her place in the universe. Nodding, Sasuke ran his fingers along the handle of his blade. Lead on, stopping in front of the massive ornate door that provided entrance to her father's chambers. Azula found herself remembering exactly where she was. She was about to receive an audience with the most powerful man in all the four nations her father and ruler, and it would not do well to enter his abode with an attitude of any kind. She was more than aware of her frustration-laden footsteps and the silence from her two companions informed her that her dissatisfaction with the situation was no great secret. Exhaling and humming sweetly in an attempt to return to her usual amenable facade laced with malice, she turned to look at her friends. My, I know this isn't a first for you, but Tai Li, do exactly as I do. Do not speak unless spoken to. Reply to anything asked of you with a bow, and under no circumstances express yourself with anything more than a small smile. Tai Li gave her a look. The Fire Lord doesn't like big smiles. Azula turned back to the door. I've seen him kill for less. With an audible gulp, Tai Li adopted a much more modest expression. The door swung open with an impressive silence for a piece of architecture quite its size. Quite like the rest of the palace, Fire Lord Ozai's chamber was one of deep black and orange, the line of fire burning before the throne the brightest colors to be found, as she had done dozens of times before. Azula strode in, briskly but respectfully. Her father sat on his throne as he always did, silhouetted intensely by the fires that lit his room. His voice that Azula had heard an uncountable number of times was just as smooth and commanding as she always remembered it. My daughter how good it is to see your face again. She bowed low. My lord, it is an honor to be returned to your presence so quickly. It was with a great deal of effort that she was able to keep from putting any resentment in that statement. 
returning her gaze upwards. Azula looked at the imposing frame of her father inquisitively. I noticed that the palace was far more empty than usual and a large number of the royal guards were displaced outside. Is there something happening? The Fire Lord raised his hand in a gesture of dismissiveness. A series of drills are being conducted by the Captain of the Guard. I was told that he intends for security to be of a much greater focus amongst the capital. Perhaps he feels the precautions you and I put in place are not enough. Azula wrinkled her nose disdainfully. He is a fool. The work we put in to secure the capital after the invasion is complete and impregnable. I quite agree, but I found it best to appease him in this case. Azula nodded in blind agreement. Her father's gesture moved to her right and left. I see you denied my guards that I sent to meet you in favor for your own. Bowing again, she replied as diplomatically as she could. Your gesture was much appreciated father, but these two are the best to have at my side. As impossible to read as always, her father leaned back and spoke with something of interest in his voice. I was hoping you might make introductions. Of course, this is my daughter. Ah, yes, how could I forget? Yukano's daughter. My apologies. My dear, forgive an old man's ailing memory. I meant nothing by it. Mai inclined her head deeply. There is nothing to forgive, your highness. Azula turned her gaze to Tai Li who was doing a remarkable job keeping her usual bounciness under control. This is Tai Li from the academy. The three of you used to play when you were children, yes. Genuinely surprised that her father, who never had time for children, or the exploits of such, had remembered this, Azula nodded. Indeed, spreading his hands in a gesture of goodwill, Fire Lord Ozai spoke with the closest thing to warmth Azula imagined she had ever heard. I welcome you both into my humble abode. I only wish it were under better circumstances. This gave Azula pause for more than one reason. She didn't think that in her entire life serving him, that she had ever heard her father slow up on his words, not even once. The Fire Lord was a man of outspoken feelings and always spoke his mind, feeling the lack of doing so to be a waste of efficiency and time. She also could never recall having ever heard something that sounded of regret mingle in her father's tone, from banishing his own son to being betrayed by Iro and Zuko on more than once occasion to ordering the entire 16th legion to march into a massacre in the hopes of catching the enemy by surprise with an aerial attack during one of the attempts on an earth nation fortress, Azula never heard any form of remorse come from her father. Slowly and carefully, she asked, Are the circumstances cause for concern, father? Forgive my impudence, but I assumed you recalled me to the capital due to pressing need, is something wrong? It was then that Fire Lord Ozai fell silent for nearly an entire minute. The harsh crackle of flames kept the room from being completely seized in silence, but the tension began to grow until it was entirely impossible to ignore. Azula could practically feel Tai Li squirming next to her and she would have admitted to feeling slightly uneasy herself. There was something her father was having trouble putting into words and that in and of itself was more than cause for concern. When he finally did speak, it was with slow and intent deliberation. I don't find this easy to say, nor will I find it easy to do but the truth is the truth and I owe this to you, my daughter. He stood, his silhouette becoming one even more imposing as his shadow lengthened on the wall behind him. He paced slowly, as though using the movement to control his words. In recent months, I have become aware of a particular ritual invented by my grandfather, your great-grandfather that if performed, might grant one such as myself exceptional potential awoken by Sazen's comet itself. Azula felt something akin to excitement begin to spread from her gut. A new way to combat the Avatar and the joint forces of the Earth and Water Nations perhaps. What is this ritual? Fire Lord Ozai reached the end of his throne's platform and turned, pacing the thirty or so feet the other direction, still speaking slowly. My daughter, are your companions loyal to this nation? She didn't even need to think in order to reply honestly. Yes, of course. I'm glad. Then they will understand, as you will, why this has to happen. As though summoned from the very shadows themselves, a cluster of hooded figures descended from the darkness belittling the room and gathered in a semicircle around the throne of Azula's father. It was not lost on her that she and her friends had been surrounded. Maya growled and Azula heard the distinct sound of her drawing her knives, and she saw Tai Li adopt a defensive stance out of the corner of her eye. The Fire Lord continued on as though there had been no sudden intrusion. The ritual set in stone by my grandfather decades ago indicated that the ability to utilize the comet to inhibit the Avatar state itself could be possible. As firebenders, we all will be able to draw power from Sazen's comet, but this ritual will grant me access to a path that will truly make me insurmountable to even the Avatar himself. He gestured around them, drawing notice to the hooded dozen figures that hadn't moved since forming their almost invasively tight circle. Azula could tell that her friends had turned their attention to them, 
but she kept her gaze locked intently on her father. There was a growing feeling in her that she couldn't quite identify, one that she honestly felt she didn't want to try and name. It is entirely possible that the nation I reign over might feel dubious of my actions here, and I have appropriately evacuated the palace so no watching I might report my doings to the populace. I apologize for that lie. The wall of fire that separated him from any onlookers parted, and he stepped down a couple of the stairs, drawing closer to them, but remaining on the steps to remain above them. Now, Azula could see his face, the face of the man she had respected more than anyone, whom she believed would be the one to bring about true change to the four nations. I had sent a group of disposable guards to fetch you as they would need to be killed along for this facade to play out. But as it stands, it will only need to be you three. He took another step down the stairs, and Azula felt her heart catch in her chest as he addressed her, in a tone almost too soft to believe it was even his. Azula, my daughter, my purest creation to perform this ritual, I have to let you go. There it was, the penultimate moment. She realized she had hadn't been breathing and pulled in a shaking, rattling breath as her world spun. Everything she had worked towards had built to this final requirement, this statement of her being. To be a loyal servant to the end, to give her father every piece of her, even her life, to fulfill the fate of the Fire Nation. There was nothing she could even think to say, nothing she could even really think to do. Her father reached out a hand towards her, beckoning in a final sort of way. Will you grant me this severance? Azula felt her hand shaking and she clasped it behind her back. There was no choice. Her life had already been given in service to her father thus far. How could she deny him this now? Her life, truly, was no more than something to be used, something to be traded for gain when said gain outweighed her usefulness. You were never even a player. The words she had spoken to the Grand Secretariat of Ba Sing Si resounded in her head. Was this what it had felt like? To finally be reduced to a party worth only what it offered by way of intrinsic value. Please, Zuzu, while you're still trying to manage your anger, I'll be second hand to our father and one of the most feared and respected people in all of the four nations. Words she had thrown at Zuko before he had departed on his banishment voyage to hunt down the Avatar rang hollowly within her mind as she swallowed. This was it. The end. Taking a long breath, Azula closed her eyes and unclenched her fists at her side. I will, father. Stealing herself, she walked forward, but had only gone a single step to kneel at the Fire Lord's feet before and hand grabbed her by the upper arm and spun her around. She then no longer saw her father's imposing visage, but that of her friend who was glaring at her with furious eyes. Are you kidding me, Zola? Tai Li's voice echoed around the chamber with a tempestuous echo that resounded with the thunder that continued to storm about beyond the walls of the palace. Her face was furious, and her eyes were glimmering with unshed tears. Is that all this was for? All your talk, and your high and mighty attitude, and you're just going to die because maybe it gives the Fire Nation a chance to beat the Avatar. Mai put a hand on Tai Li's shoulder, and Azula could see that her sullen friend was crying fully, shaking silently, but her hand was thrown away. Azula waited to be yelled at again, but after a long second of staring at her desperately, Tai Li finally shook her head and took forward, knocking her aside and moving to stand closest to her father. I'm sorry, your highness, but I can't let you kill your own daughter. Azula's heart was a storm of emotion, indignation that Tai Li had butted in, worry that her father was going to disintegrate her friend on the spot, and something that might have been affection trying to worm its way past all her negative feelings. She couldn't find a single thing to say as the Fire Lord stared down at the young woman who now blocked his path towards what he believed to be certain victory. Shouldering gently past Azula, Mai paced forward reluctantly, head bowed. For a moment, Azula was sure she was going to pull Tai Li back, but then, to her horror, Mai slowly withdrew a knife from the inside of her sleeve and directed it forwards toward the Fire Lord. Her arm shook a moment, before it steadied, whatever you gain from this, my lord, I promise it will never be worth it. Azula couldn't believe what she was seeing. Minutes ago, she had been on a way to an audience with her father, albeit under peculiar circumstances, but it was still something she had done a hundred times before. Now, her only two friends in the world were threatening her father, the most powerful man in all of the four nations as though meaning to deny him. It was all so impossible, she couldn't hardly believe it. The Fire Lord cocked his head, and asked, My daughter, I fear the loyalty to these two was perhaps not what you claimed it to be. Finding the ability to move again as she was addressed, Azula stumbled forward numbly, grabbing both of her friends. Stop it both of you, this is what I want. As though the words were coming from somewhere beyond her own head, she turned to her father. If I submit, will you let them go? I know they have disrespected you, but I implore you to find forgiveness and allow them to live. She bowed her head. I am your humble servant, and I will always submit to your will. 
My only desire is that these two may live on. The Fire Lord regarded her as my and Tai Li made noises of protest before speaking over them. I hadn't intended for there to be witnesses to this moment, but for you, my daughter, I will allow them their lives. Tai Li stepped furiously towards him, we don't need your. Desperate to keep her friend from making such a devastating mistake, Azula took Tai Li by the shoulders and forced her to meet her eyes. Tai Li, please, do not make this any harder than it need be. The Fire Nation's victory is worth more than my life. She choked on the last word and nearly couldn't speak it. Mai stared at her disgustedly over Tai Li's shoulder. Words of a slave. Azula looked to Mai angrily. Just because I've decided to make my life mean something beyond moping around and waiting to die doesn't translate to slavery. Go, Mai. Giving Tai Li a gentle push away from her, Azula watched Mai carefully. She was met with a hardened stare for several long moments, and she waited to be further disputed. But finally, Mai took a now crying Tai Li by the arm and turned her away. Have it your way. And without looking back, she marched them both away. The hooded enforcers stepped silently apart to allow them passage and as she watched them go, Azula felt a hundred things she could say roll over her tongue. But in the end, she wasn't strong enough to tell her two friends what they truly meant to her and she turned back to her father in resignation. He had not moved and she approached him, her heart hammering in her chest. Neil, my daughter. As she reached the bottom step, she obeyed, closing her eyes. Stupidly, she wondered if death was something that hurt. Your sacrifice will be remembered, Azula. You will live on in our ark. Azula's eyes flashed open at her father's snarl and she looked up to see that a knife had sprouted from his shoulder. His fingers grasped at it and at the sound of a scuffle behind her. Azula turned to see that Tai Li had already subdued two of the men forming the semicircle, and Mai had raced past her, arm already pulling back to sling several more knives. At once, Azula reached out a hand in an attempt to stop Mai, but before she could even utter a word, a pair of the hooded man had taken her down before any more knives could be thrown. At a cry from behind her, Azula turned and watched as Tai Li was taken down by no less than four of the silent soldiers and restrained. Ahead of her Mai grunted in pain as one of the men threw a punch into her gut and she doubled over. They forced her to her knees where she gasped and looked at Azula, face agonized, but her eyes more still. A clatter sounded next to Azula as the blade her father had pulled from his shoulder fell to the ground, still glistening in the glow of the fire with his blood. She saw his face alive with anger staring down at her as he raised his hand in her direction. Enough. As she realized what was about to happen, Azula couldn't even think to close her eyes. Flame coalesced around his palm, a burning white glow ready to pierce her body and fell her. Mai screamed in protest, but it was a muffled sound as the pounding of her heart thundered in Azula's head. In the next moment, several things happened. Fire Lord Ozai unleashed a firebolt at his daughter, tight and pointed, aimed directly at her heart. Azula remained where she had been, half risen to her feet before she was knocked aside. Tai Li, who had somehow escaped the grasp of the men who had ceased her attack, had come in from the side and struck her in the shoulder. And as Azula fell to the ground, she watched as the flaming bolt of pure heat and fury tore into her friend and Tai Li collapsed without a word. The sounds of everything around her became very clear at that point. The sound of Mai crying in despair, the crackling of the fire, her own breathing. Something was rising from deep within her, and it wasn't anything she knew how to deal with. She turned to look at her father who was looking on with something that was likely disdain and it clicked. Azula hadn't lied when she claimed that her life had less meaning. But Tai Li surely had. As the rising in her throat finally came forth, she screamed in anger and threw a wall of burning blue flame directly at her father. She had time to see the look of shock on his face before the fire smothered him like a blanket. Stumbling away and stunned at what she had done, Azula was able to jerk her head to the left and blast away the men holding Mai down. She found herself barking orders, the one thing that didn't seem horrifyingly out of place. Help me get Tai Li, we'll have to. This was as far as she got before a jet of lightning struck her in the chest. She arched her back in pain and dropped to her knees her eyes blurring with agony as she saw her father slicing through the attack she had thrown at him. Even then, though, his voice reflected only deep regret. My child, you would strike me. Freed from her captors, Mai was able to get off a single knife that the Fire Lord shot from the air with an arc of fire before the men Azula had blasted were replaced. As the lightning dissipated and Azula gasped for breath, she found herself dragged up and forced to her knees alongside Mai. Not able to even look in her father's direction, she turned to look at Mai weakly. The words came freely then, almost miraculous in the ease at which they flowed. She knew she didn't have long to say them, Mai, I'm so sorry. I never wanted this for you, or Tai Li. Mai only looked at her sadly. Above them, Fire Lord Ozai growled. My own daughter, turned against me by something as pathetic as friendship. 
though this pains me to no end. Perhaps it is a mercy I strike you down before you betray me further. He seemed as though he might have had more to say. But in an instant, the very ground beneath him rose up and encased him from the neck down in a casket of earth. The floor beneath Mai and Azula tipped up and they both were dumped away from the hooded men. Azula rolled upright in time to see them all knocked up by pillars that shot out of the ground with vicious speed and then, while they were still floating in the air like dolls, a sweeping arc of lightning roared through the air and ripped them to pieces as their remains fell to the ground. Azula watched as the child she knew to be called Toph rode a wave of the palace floor to stop next to her, hands raised in an aggressive earthbending stance. Haya, princess, hope we're not intruding on anything too important. Ahead of them, her father's entombment glowed red hot before bursting away from him in a blow-up of magma. He glared down at Toph, his rage on full display as he whipped a firestorm together above him preparing to unleash it on the only remaining people living in his chamber. You dare to attack me. He never finished flinging his firestorm however as Azula caught sight of a shadow just behind the roaring flames her father had whirled to life. Breaking through the waves of heat completely unscathed, she saw none other than the young man she had fought briefly at Boiling Rock Prison come flying towards the Fire Lord's back. The same lightning he had just used to blast away the hooded guards still crackling around his arm. There was no time to see it coming and all at once, her father was blown over her head in a din of pure blue energy as the attack met its mark. The Fire Lord was dashed against the ground of his very chamber, thrown several dozen yards before skidding to a halt. He immediately picked himself up and glared towards where the prisoner stood, just where he had moments before. The exchange of places seemed oddly appropriate as the prisoner pointed at Fire Lord Ozai with his glowing hand, blue sparks of energy spitting from it wildly. Looks like this party is really getting started. Sasu couldn't quite believe his timing. He and Toph had broken and just as Ozai had been about to fully cremate his own daughter, just as Zuko had believed would be the end goal. Toph's quick thinking had been just what they needed and now, he had his chance. Azula was saved, and now he could turn his attention to things that concerned him more. He flicked his gaze down to see that Mai had rushed to Tai Li's side, the latter wasn't moving, and Sasuke knew they didn't have time for sentiment, regardless of who might be dead. Toph, get them out of here. A slab of earth the size of a small bed lifted from the ground, carrying Tai Li's body aloft. Toph grabbed both the dazed-looking Mai and the stunned-looking Azula by the wrists and ran with them at the wall, as the floating rocky gurney trailed after them. Just as they were about to collide with the side of the chamber, the very wall itself pulled apart to allow them access. Snarling, Ozai drew up a great many flaming orbs and hurled them at the retreating women. But Toph threw up a shield of earth behind them, taking the attacks full on. Not deterred, Ozai leapt after them, fire blowing from his palms and feet propelling him forward. In all this, he must have forgotten about Sasuke. Meeting him in midair, Sasuke allowed himself a quip before throwing down a tremendously quick Tejutsu combo and flinging him backwards. They both landed on their feet, Ozai a little shakily and Sasuke half turned to see Toph, still with the three young women in tow, turning back questioningly at him. This wasn't something that he had discussed with her and for good reason. He had no clue if he would actually be leaving with her at all. Go. She blinked and shook her head, taking a step forward. Sasuke cursed and uttered, Earth release, Earth style wall. A great piece of earth rocketed up from below, shaking the very chamber itself. Nearly as wide and as tall as the entire side of the chamber wall, it blocked Toph and her company from Sasuke's view and he returned his gaze to the Fire Lord. As it had been generated and moved with his chakra, it would take a reasonable amount of effort for Toph to move it as its energy differed from his own. Hopefully, she would take the hint and take off while they still had the chance. Sasuke had other plans. Pointing intently at Ozai, he spoke calmly and directly. You have answers I need. There was a string of seconds in which the Fire Lord simply blinked at him and Sasuke realized he hadn't been recognized immediately. Stepping forward and more so into the glow of the surrounding fire, he snapped, Remember me now. Ozai's face dawned with recognition and a disbelieving smile crept subtly onto his face. It's you, the boy who broke into my grandfather's temple and tried to kill me. Seeing no reason to waste time, Sasuke spoke truthfully. Believe it or not, I have very little memory of our first encounter, but I do know that you locked me up in the depths of that dump to hold on to me for whatever reason. The Fire Lord laughed and fresh fire was whipped to life around him. It seems I should have not taken you so lightly, boy. I will not make that mistake again. Knowing that hell was about to break loose, Sasuke tried to quickly pry some form of information. How did I come to be in your temple? Why was I imprisoned instead of executed? Ozai's gaze darkened and he growled, his powerful voice resonating over the hissing of his summoned flames. I'm not in the mood to play games. You have taken my daughter from me and I must require her. 
Is that all she's good for? Your own child. Nothing more than a sacrifice for a ritual you don't even know will work. It is my duty, my purpose to make the difficult decisions that no one else will. As Fire Lord that means putting my position before my family. Suddenly, there was a flash in Sasuke's head and the words he had heard while dreaming raced into pummel his consciousness. But more than that he saw a face hovering before him, one that, at a glance, was like looking in a mirror. Black eyes and a slightly older complexion told him that it was not exactly him, but his mere appearance was enough to cause Sasuke's heart to churn. It was due to this sudden visualization of someone from his past that he only was able to move slightly away from an enormous fireball that detonated at the ground at his feet. It tossed him away, but he was able to catch himself and land feet first near the Fire Lord's throne. Ozai was bearing down on him now, his face alive with excitement and malice. If you want answers so badly, you'll have to find them yourself. The battle only raged for a minute before Sasuke realized the odds he was against. He had made this trip under the confident expectation that there were no beings in this world that would be able to stand against his vast array of jutsu and natural techniques such as his sharingan. But Ozai was something beyond what he had expected. The Fire Lord's attacks were ferocious, swift and worst of all, constant. There was no room to recover, to set up anything, to even try and analyze what was being struck at him. If Ozai was abiding by the laws of Chakra, it would be a near impossibility that he was able to maintain such constant aggression and pressure. But with every wall of fire that was put in his path, with very burning whip that seared at his flesh, with every tidal wave of heat that scorched across the room, Sasuke knew that he was fighting a very different kind of enemy. There was no time to cast a jutsu, no time to even think about how to proceed. Finally, he got careless as he leapt between pillars and a fireball caught him in the side, sending him crashing into the wall and to the ground. As he blinked away the pain, he heard Ozai behind him cackling energetically. This was all you had to offer. I would have guessed you were made of sterner stuff, boy. You already gave me what I wanted, old man. You like fire so much, let's see if you can really take the heat. From his place on the ground, Sasuke had been given more than enough time to concentrate and prepare his move. The Fire Lord's hubris giving him exactly what he needed to pull together his chakra. Blood dripping from his eye, he launched himself to his feet and whipped his head around. Amaterasu. But as the onyx flame burst from the ground, Ozai was no longer standing where Sasuke had known him to be. He had time to look up just in time to see the Fire Lord bearing down on him with fire erupting from his palms. Roaring, Sasuke cast a substitution jutsu and pulled himself behind Ozai, tackling the older man from behind. What are you was all that Ozai had time to snarl before they both hit the ground heavily. Sasuke used the force of the impact to roll to his feet and direct his black flame towards the Fire Lord who was trying to pull himself up. He had barely straightened before the Amaterasu had reached him, searing at his robes and working to engulf him. Sasuke watched him flail about for a moment beneath the fire release technique, but was stunned to see that the Fire Lord had begun to laugh. Ozai turned to face him, fully wrapped in the pitch black fire, but seeming entirely unharmed. No matter the fire, I cannot be touched, not as long as the heat remains loyal to me. He boomed before tossing Sasuke aside like a leaf caught in a gale. As he hit the ground on the other side of the chamber, Sasuke doused the Amaterasu and saw Ozai continuing towards him as though the fire had never been there at all, an orange aura enwrapping his person. Sasuke got to his feet with a wince and his sharing and flared to life. If this keeps up, I'm going to get pissed. I don't understand what you're doing here. Is the Avatar with you? Toph shook her head at Mai's question as she continued to feel her way through the palace, working towards the grounds that housed the royal airships that she and Sasuke had previously discussed. She had assured Mai that Tai Li was still breathing and that her best chance was for them to escape as quickly as possible. Still, that didn't stop her from continuing to fling questions. Nope, just me and the asshole. But, not for the first time, Mai made to turn around as if expecting to catch a glance of him. Toph pulled on her wrist again and she fell reservedly back in line. But who is he? Why is he with you? Trying to keep her entourage of previous enemies in line compounded with attempting to work her way towards her destination, and with Mai hammering her with questions, Toph was starting to feel slightly overwhelmed. She wasn't even going to think about the fact that she was perhaps feeling a little worried for her companion. Turning sharply down a hall, Toph answered as concisely as she could. His name is Sasuke, and he came along with me to make sure her highness here didn't get buried. Why? Toph sighed irritably. Because Zuko pitched a big fit and didn't want to let Azula die. He wanted to come himself, but he was talked down because he wouldn't stand a chance talking to her. And we need him alive to teach on firebending. So Sasuke volunteered to make the trip warn Azula and I tagged along. 
Maya's pace slowed briefly at the mention of that particular name, Zuko. Huffing, Toph snapped. Yeah, yeah and I sure he'll be more than happy to see you too. But in case you forgot, you just attempted to kill the Fire Lord, and we're still inside the Fire Nation Palace. So, how about we get out of here and then worry about being all excited to see old flings? Zuko was not a, yeah, yeah. They resumed their hurried escape in what was finally some variable of silence and Toph was able to focus on what she was truly concerned about. Bringing Tai Lee was of no issue as she barely seemed conscious. Katara would have to take at her before she even opened her eyes again. Mai was moving with a frantic, harried pace as though she was having trouble keeping track of the pure chaos she had been thrown into. But Toph didn't feel as though she were dangerous. Hazula, on the other hand, was no less than worrying. Toph hadn't let go of the princess's wrist since they began rushing their way from the Fire Lord's chamber and while she had made no attempt to resist or even speak up, everything about her seemed wrong. Toph had encountered Azula enough to come to expect a very usual air of arrogance, confidence and coldness, but there was nothing to be sensed in her now. Her pulse beat slowly and her pace was jerky and unsteady, Toph almost felt that Azula would topple over if she let her go. Azula hadn't said a word as well since they had begun to walk out and the very fact that there was nothing to indicate how she was feeling had Toph on edge. And as they rushed further and further from the Fire Lord's chamber and Toph felt tremendous rushes of energy running from that same room towards them, she silently dared to hope. Sasuke don't you die on me. In her head, she kept replaying it over and over. Her father, demonic and endless in his desire, loosing his attack towards her. Tai Lee, endlessly faithful, pushing her aside. My screaming as Azula had never heard before as their friend collapsed silently. The young man she now knew to be named Sasuke arriving alongside Toph to save them. And in the middle of it all, herself, Azula, useless and faltering. Her will felt like it was rushing out of her as though a great dam had broken in her heart and everything that had driven her forward was flowing away, never to be harnessed again. It was agony and yet nothing. And all she could think, over and over, why is it that all I have left are my sins? Oz I never saw it coming. One moment he was confidently stepping towards Sasuke, the next, he had been completely frozen in place, victim of a particularly crafty jutsu, not daring to move in the risk of breaking the shadow possession jutsu that he had cast. Sasuke simply stared at the Fire Lord who stood a few long paces away, unmoving and teeth grit in concentration. Closing off his sharingan, Sasuke pushed himself to his feet, dusting off his shoulders. You won't be able to move. I've connected my shadow to yours, and as long as it stays that way, you're completely immobilized. That big firestorm you were getting ready to throw my way won't be happening. He took a small amount of satisfaction from the look of surprise on Ozai's face that he had been read at all, but knew he didn't have much time. After snaring his opponent, he had cast Wind Release. Hunter Sense and the Wind had told him that not only was a great mass of soldiers converging on the Fire Lord's chamber, they were also entering through the back of the palace and would be meeting with Toph shortly. That wouldn't do. Trying to not show any of the pain he was feeling as a result of the beating he had taken from Ozai, Sasuke straightened and spoke briskly. I'll give you a last chance to save your own skin. What do you know about me? Ozai's snarl turned into a sadistic grin. You really can't leave that alone, can you? Well, the truth then, I don't know a thing about you, boy. Sasuke stared in anger as the Fire Lord continued on. You were thrown into the bottom of Boiling Rock because I didn't know what to do with you. I had to put you somewhere you were kept out of sight, so rumors wouldn't spread that an infiltrator such as you even existed. I intended to send along orders for my daughter to interrogate you following her arrival to overlook the prison. But those plans were cut short for a multitude of reasons. I know nothing about you, Sasuke, save for your impossible adeptness with multiple elements and your impossible entry into my grandfather's temple. His eyes were alight with glee at the clear displeasure his lack of a real answer had caused Sasuke, who triggered his own eyes to peer into Ozai's heart, but his jutsu turned up nothing. The Fire Lord was being truthful. Finding this difficult to wrestle with, Sasuke growled towards the ground. Yeah, those plans wouldn't have lasted. I forgot. You find your daughter only worthwhile as a lamb to be butchered in a primitive attempt to gain power from a celestial body. Hard to believe you're what everyone's so scared of. Sasuke was glad to see, at least, that this seemed to have gotten somewhat under Ozai's skin. He tilted up his chin and snapped in return. Don't act like you have any right to judge me, child. My daughter understood, though it is clear you, nor her friends could do the same. For what I am willing to pay, the return I will gain will be enough to fully cement my place, the Fire Nation's place, in history. His manic expression was enough to give Sasuke pause, there would be no debating with this man. No words would show him the error of his ways, though his entire purpose currently was to uncover the reason behind his own existing in this world. 
Sasuke found himself not entirely opposed to snuffing out this contemptible man for what he deemed a worthy trade for the life of his own daughter. His hand brushed the hilt of his sword as he considered drawing it and taking the life of the Fire Lord. It would be so easy. The Fire Lord had to fall to the hand of Aum. Katara had made this very clear to him before he had departed the temple. This would be the only way true balance could be restored to the Four Nations, and Sasuke was not to get any ideas about trying to take down the Fire Lord on his own. But here he was, here in the now, with the very man in question helpless before him. Sasuke found himself drawing his sword and angling it at the ground near his feet. Would it not be better for everyone if he made did this now? It could be reported that Ong had been the one to strike down the Fire Lord, if that's what the people needed to hear. All Sasuke needed to do was pull back his sword, rush forward and... Ahead of him Ozai cocked his head. I must ask you who is it you think has been trapped? I didn't expect such prowess from you, young man, nor did I expect the danger you posed. I will remedy that. There was a glowing glint behind him and Sasuke turned in time just to throw up a defensive jutsu. Wind release, heightened current. With the rush of wind flowing chaotically in all directions but towards him, the downpour of fireballs that had been cast in his direction were swept away, either splashing against the walls and pillars or were dissipated entirely. As Sasuke came out of his evasive movement in a tight roll, he saw a countless number of Fire Nation soldiers conglomerated where he and Toph had entered the chambers not minutes ago. He also realized that following his movement and break in concentration, Ozai no longer was bound by his shadow possession jutsu, and now seemed entirely bored with the situation. The Fire Lord rubbed his wrists apathetically and gestured dismissively in Sasuke's direction as the pounding of armored feet overtook the room. This assassin broke into my chambers and attempted to kill me, and his compatriots have kidnapped Princess Azula. Destroy him and order the rest of your men, Captain, to find my daughter and retrieve her. Sasuke had a single moment to turn and face the several dozen armored individuals whom had poured into the room before a rush of fire nearly overtook him. Turning and sprinting towards the stone wall he had erected to wall himself off from Toph and tore it down blowing the pieces back over his shoulder to slow the progress of his pursuers. As he scrambled through the hole in the wall, he rolled to the side to recover his breath. He heard a great deal of noise behind him as the steady flow of soldiers moved to pursue. Just before Sasuke turned to continue his escape, he heard the captain ask the Fire Lord, Your Highness, what should be done with the ones who took your daughter? I believe they were two of my daughter's friends turned traitor and a young earthbender who is not to be underestimated. I injured one of them, but kill them all regardless, Captain, I don't want any survivors. Before they even reached the back entrance of the palace, Azula slowly found herself returning to reality. She saw a piece of earth carrying the unconscious body of Tai Lee on her left as she felt a tight, firm grip around her wrist. She saw Mai to her left as well as both of them were being dragged along the dimly lit corridors by one of the last people she would expect. Toph was pulling her along as though she were even younger than the girl in question. Finally coming to her senses of what was happening, she dug her heels in and yanked her wrist free from the grip of the younger girl. Their small procession came to a halt as Azula looked frantically around at her situation, unsure of what to say. It took only a couple seconds before her opening and closing mouth finally thought of words to say, and she pointed accusatorily at Toph. Her finger seemed to tremble beyond her control. You, you are the enemy. You break into my father's palace and... Mai walked up beside her, looking into her eyes intently, and saved us, Azula. Our lives are forfeit here. As she recalled what happened, Azula turned wildly towards where they had come, feeling a distinct numbness spreading throughout her fingers and feet. We can go back. He'll forgive us, I know he will. He'll get Tai Lee to a doctor. He'll let you go, Mai, if we just... She trailed off as the absurdity of what she was saying settled in. In a turn, it was actually Toph who walked up and jabbed her in the stomach sharply. Wincing, Azula looked down angrily to see the girl directing her attention in her relative direction, a fed-up expression on her face. Is that what you think this is going to come down to? You trusting the goodwill of the maniac who was about to kill you for something he doesn't even have proof will work. After everything you've done for him, all the trouble you've caused us personally, he still is ready to trash you for what he thinks will be a greater advantage. I doubt it would have worked anyway, even if this stupid ritual is the real deal. He doesn't love you, he never did. And so he would gain nothing by losing you, and he wouldn't care one bit that it didn't work regardless. Azula could think of nothing to say as each sentence that the small earthbender uttered smashed into her insides with an overwhelming force. Because no matter how she tried to spin it in her head, that Toph was an enemy, a child, someone who had no idea what this all meant. Everything she said made too much sense. Next to her, Mai put a hand on her shoulder tentatively and Azula recoiled, shouting now, 
And you, you threw a knife at him. You could have killed him. Mai shrugged, wish that I had. Azula swallowed in a desperate attempt to find more words to sling angrily, when she caught sight of the floating table of earth that hovered next to them at about chest level. Tai Li lay atop it. Eyes closed, she looked very peaceful. A horrible circle of black extended from her left shoulder outward to stretch from her neck down to near her breast. It didn't take a medical expert to tell that she was in something near critical condition. As she stared transfixed at the barely breathing form of her friend, Mai's voice seemed to echo from some distance away. In his eyes, we're all guilty now. You attacked him too, you'll remember, Azula. I know it hurts, it probably all hurts more than I can imagine, but you have to be strong now. You can stay here and give up your life, or you can leave with us and live. Find purpose again. Purpose, was that what she wanted? What she needed? Her brother had sailed the entire ocean multiple times over in brash pursuit of his honor and pride, something Azula had never failed to joke loftily about as she enjoyed her position of power and luxury. Was this how Zuko had felt? No, Zuko had been better off than her. He had been graced with a goal, something to chase. Unable to stop herself, she dropped to her knees and let out a strangled moan. She saw Mai and Toph react to her outburst with surprised confusion, both of them raising their hands slightly and stepping away. Azula couldn't have cared less in that moment. The hurt was too much, the absolute pain of it, of not knowing what was for certain any longer. She wanted to close her eyes and wake up from this madness, this imposed torture, this. That's it. She leapt to her feet in exclamation and Toph and Mai stepped back again. The latter cocked her head inquisitively, still keeping a safe distance. What's it, Azula? Hardly able to believe how simple it was to her now that the answer had been shown as perfect and pure as anything. Azula stared at her friend almost unaware of the frenzied and mad smile that was likely stretching across her face. That's Sasuke. This is one of his tricks, one of those you know. What he did to the both of us at the prison. This isn't real, none of it. She pointed to them one by one, a laugh bubbling up from her throat. You're not real. And you're not real. And you're not real. The laughter rode a crescendo up into a mad shriek of hysteric mirth as she slammed her open palms against her chest. And I'm not real. None of this has happened. Any moment now I'll wake up from this dream and then I'll find that bastard and drown him in his own. Mai's voice was so smooth and strong that even though it was much lower in volume, it cut through Azula's ramblings with an overwhelming power. Azula, you're not dreaming. The relief she had felt from her realization was already fading and she tried to reach out and grab it, cling to it and hold it tight to her mental consciousness, but it still continued to slip away. Her desperation peaking, Azula brought to life a handful of blue fire that roiled intensely over her palm. Toph took up a defensive stance immediately, but she needn't have worried, Azula thought. She was going to disappear now, disappear just like the nothing she was. You'll see. She cried out as shook down the sleeve of her free arm. She looked at the smooth and perfect skin of her forearm and brought the flame to it in an instant. Immediately, pain flashed from the point of contact and spread through her entire body with a ravenous stinging. Mai shouted something, but Azula ignored her and kept the fire pressed against her skin, screaming through her clenched teeth as tears of pain blurred her vision. Any second now, any second, I'll wake up, any second, any see. The pain in her arm disappeared and was replaced with a fresh aching as Mai tackled her to the ground, breaking her concentration and causing the flame to disappear. Azula, stop it. Unable to stand it any longer, Azula howled against her friend's grip, thrashing about and trying to free herself. You don't get it. Let me go. I can get myself out. I just need to. There is nothing to escape from, Azula. Mai managed to restrain her by the wrists and held her down. Panting, Azula looked up to see Mai's face streaked with tears. This is it. This is what we've chosen. You can't just take it back. Tai Li could die because she chose to save you. We could all die now because of the choices we made back there. Swiftly, she pulled Azula up into a tight hug where she sat and shook with a sob against her. This is what we have. Each other. Please. Please believe me. The dream Sasuke had made for her was so real that Azula actually believed for a moment that this was indeed the real Mai. But no, the real Mai would never show this kind of emotion and Tai Li would never have sacrificed herself for Azula's sake. What had Azula ever done to warrant such selflessness on her behalf? No, none of it added up, it couldn't add up. She's right. That hearing the voice, Azula slammed her eyelids tightly shut. She knew this voice, and she didn't want to hear it. She didn't want to be told what she knew deep down she already believed to be true. But slowly, she opened her eyes and looked over Mai's shoulder to see Sasuke standing in the hallway, looking battered. He looked as though he had sustained several burns, but he still looked entirely unfazed. This isn't of my doing, princess. You want the truth, the reality of your world. 
after staring into his black eyes for a long moment. Azula nodded after which Sasuke simply directed his finger at Toph. She just told it to you. You're unloved by your father, and you're unloved by yourself. I know what you are, Azula. You've thrown aside every piece of your humanity, locked it away to hunt down some goal that you believe will grant you fulfillment. But now that you know that goal was for nothing, you don't know what to think or what to believe. He closed the distance and crouched down near where Azula and Mai sat embracing one another. Mai pulled away slightly and directed a knife towards Sasuke in a defensive gesture, but he paid it no mind. This is your reality. You can let it drown you, or you can throw it to the ground and stomp on it, and craft it anew. His words battered against her just as hard as Toph's had. Could he be right? Could he really be telling her exactly what she needed to hear? If she accepted the truth of what the three of them had just told her, there would be no going back, no living in further denial, only the pain of her every waking moment. It would gouge at her heart for the rest of her life, and she didn't feel she would be able to bear it. Suddenly, she smelled the crackling of a wood fire, heard the distant rush of waves and felt sand beneath her feet. For so long I thought that if my dad accepted me, I'd be happy. I'm back home now, my dad talks to me. Ha, huh. he even thinks I'm a hero. Everything should be perfect, right? I should be happy now, but I'm not. I'm angrier than ever and I don't know why. And she broke, dropping her head into Mai's chest and cried her defeat and her loss, letting it flow as freely as Zuko's words had that night. Because now, she knew just how he had felt. Sasuke looked down at the collapsed and defeated young woman in front of him. Truly, it might have been pitiable had it not been so pathetic. Her luxury is gone. Her power is gone. This is what she has now, and she probably won't even be able to deal with it. Not that it mattered much to Sasuke. Half of his job was already done, and now came the difficult part. He turned his gaze up to speak to Toph who stood as rigid as a board and looking rather like she was hoping to not be noticed during this drama. The jig is up. Ozai has the royal guard back inside the palace and they'll be working their way around towards us. We don't have much time. Pulling Azula to her feet, Mai was the first to reply to him and he noted the open distrust she eyed him with. Still, her words spoke only to their situation and not their past. This way should get us to the royal airships, but I don't know how we'll get enough altitude and speed in time to get away from the firebending they're inevitably going to sling our way. Sasuke dismissed this. You let me worry about that. Lead the way. Mai gave him a last stink eye before jogging ahead, holding Azula's arm to make sure she maintained pace. Toph and Sasuke followed behind her, the medical makeshift tablet hovering after them. He gave it a glance as they jogged onwards. We really need the extra baggage. Toph sniffed haughtily at him before replying. Well, if I leave Tai Li behind, Mai will stay behind for her, thus leaving the psychotic and likely unstable princess to us. Second, us bringing her along doesn't lose us any time and lastly, if she's against the Fire Lord now, she'd be a pretty strong asset to the team. She turned her head slightly in his direction and added, All that, and if we leave her here, she'll be executed as a traitor. It wouldn't do you any harm to show some compassion every once in a while, you asshole. To this, Sasuke didn't reply. Her points were valid enough and he had no time to open up a debate on empathy and morality. After several more hallways, Mai threw a pair of wide doors and the full fury of the storm that Sasuke and Toph had only recently left roared at them again. Toph froze in place and Sasuke risked putting a hand on her shoulder reassuringly to spur her onwards. It fortunately worked and as a crack of thunder sounded overhead and with the rain and wind whipping at them, Mai had to shout to be heard. And I don't suppose anyone took into account this storm either. With the arm that wasn't supporting Azula, she gestured forward and Sasuke saw about a half dozen airships being tossed tightly around, their mooring keeping them mostly in place. They were about the same size as the military one that he and Toph had flown over, but were sleeker and their balloons were more streamlined. Starting towards the closest one, Mai called back. We'll need to get a fire going quick to start the burners, but if we can manage that relatively quickly, I know of a route where Og. She shouted in pain as the shaft of an arrow planted in her upper back glistened in the torchlight from the palace and the lighting above them. Sasuke whirled to see several dark figures on the roof of the structure, armed with bows and pikes. Several arrows whizzed by them, burying themselves in the ground and bouncing off the stone steps. Waving a hand, Sasuke shouted, move. He raced forward to help Mai up the rest of the way while Toph levitated the slab carrying Tai Li aboard the small basket. Grunting, Mai pushed him aside as he made to help her on board. Don't treat me like some little girl. Toph leapt from the basket and smashed her feet heavily on the ground, raising a shield of pure earth to stave off the flurry of arrows sent their way. I heard that. Mai spared a smile at Toph's comment and gave Sasuke another weak push, wincing as she did. 
I'll live. Got any fire for us? Drawing up his hands to perform the jutsu, Sasuke watched as a burst of blue flame sprang to life on the burner, and he turned his head to see Azula looking at the fire she had started, wisps of sapphire heat still curving around her hand. She met his gaze and then looked away immediately. Sasuke, he turned at the shout of his name to see Toph gesturing forward. Ahead of her, dozens of royal guards were spilling from the palace doors and heading their way. I can feel more of them coming around the sides of the palace too. He raced up beside her and threw several of his makeshift kunai to force back the archers. How many? The panicked look on her face was enough and he turned to face the onslaught heading their way. Running up the barrier Toph had pulled from the ground, he leapt into the air, narrowing his eyes as fireballs shot past him. See how you like it. Amaterasu, melding with the darkness imposed by the storm, a wall of black fire followed his gaze from one end of the grounds to the other, blocking off most of the potential attackers and igniting those unlucky enough to be caught in its path. As Sasuke landed, he turned his hands and eyes up and the black fire swirled over the roof, wrapping up all the archers and pikemen he could see. A large fireball rushed over his head and nearly struck the balloon of the airship that Mai was currently in the process of detaching from its mooring and Sasuke looked up to see several airships descending towards them. Clearly of military make, he saw long rods ascending from the casings of their balloons, clearly there to act as lightning rods and make them capable to operation even during a storm. They rocked in the heavy wind and rain, but still approached quickly, those aboard adding to the bombardment. Sasuke leapt away to higher ground and made several quick symbols with his hands. Water release, slicing formation. At his command, much of the water falling from the sky coalesced to form a great many disks of pure water. Water release, rising water severing. Five more words and several hand symbols later, the disks rocketed towards the airships, slicing at the balloons, the baskets and those aboard. Sasuke saw several men fall from their positions, missing limbs and one of the airships began to spiral out of control, one of the discs clearly having hit a weak point in the balloon's structure. As Sasuke prepared another volley, he looked down at a shrill cry. Toph had been working her way back towards the balloon and had taken an arrow in both the midsection and the arm. She was somehow on her feet, but struggling to reach the basket as arrows and fireballs continued to whip past her. Sasuke made to jump down from his place on the higher ground. But as he watched, Azula leapt from her place aboard the airship and drew up a wall of blue flame and with a pushing motion, hurled it at the royal guard who were finding ways to work around the Amaterasu and continue to press their attack. Azula reached down and lifted Toph, carrying her back to the ship as her flames burned their victims to a crisp. Sasuke cocked his head. Well, what do you know? But as he looked on, he saw a spear of fire slam into Azula's back as she hoisted Toph aboard. He saw her face clench in pain and she dropped to the ground and sent a flurry of flaming blue spheres in every which way. But Sasuke saw that there were just too many of them. Fire Rel was as far as he got before a massive fireball exploded behind him and threw him forward and onto the rain-soaked stone. His sharing and saved him from taking another hit as he rolled away. But he watched another fireball race towards the balloon before a giant piece of earth rushed up to deflect it in midair as Toph continued to assist even in her weakened state. Azula was trying to pull herself aboard despite her injury, and was also blasting incoming projectiles from the air, her shining blue fire matching the lightning crackling above them. Sasuke looked back to the enemy and saw just how overwhelmed they were. Despite his Amaterasu, soldiers were using their firebending to propel themselves over it and even with him tracking his black fire up to catch some of them, there were too many. On top of that, the airships continued to descend and more and more archers poured over the roof, adding their arrows to the chaos, invisible until their shafts bounced off the ground or stuck somewhere, one of which caught Sasuke in the chest and he gasped at the sudden trauma. He drew up his Chidori to lance at the archers, but before he could release it, another monstrous fireball crushed the ground in front of him and he was thrown backwards, landing heavily on the stairs. There were just too many of them. Looking over his shoulder as his vision swam hazily, he watched a struggling Toph and Azula lend their powers to keep their slowly rising airship from being struck, and he saw Mai grappling with the controls, trying to account for the multitude of dangers that made their takeoff near impossible. He looked back to the countless soldiers spilling towards them over the palace grounds and finally closed his eyes. No, this was pathetic. He was going to be overcome by foot soldiers. He, Sasuke, was going to be taken down this easily. Huh. Picking himself up, he put a hand above his head, fingers jutting skyward. All at once, the wind seemed to gather in a tight current, racing upwards and swirling into the clouds. Then, the clouds themselves tightened into a funnel, lightning flashing through the center of its point. 
the sky above them began to fade in its darkness, becoming overwhelmed by the flashing blue surges that conjoined thousands of feet above Sasuke's head. The soldiers began to take notice and point, but it was already too late. Sasuke glared at them with furious eyes. Disappear with the thunder. His voice seemed to carry despite the low volume of his tone, echoing over the grounds. The royal guard seemed to fully understand that he was about to do something and their attention turned from assailing the airship to flinging attacks his way. From fireballs to airships to arrows, the attacks were all blown away from him as the lightning peaked and gathered at his fingertips. His eyes flashed. Kirin, the very heavens themselves seemed to be split asunder and a piercing shine rolled from the very middle of the clouds, but the shine was more than just a luminescent beam. As it descended, it took on shape, beginning to spiral as it did, and by the time it was within a few hundred feet of the palace itself, the beaming blue lightning had formed into a dragon as wide as any of the airships with a furious, vicious head, its fangs rippling with lightning. It came to swirl above Sasuke's head, the manifestation of his will prepared to release at his barest nudge. For a moment, Sasuke took in the enormity of his creation and how it had stunned his entire opposition into complete immobility. The soldiers had stopped trying to clear his Amaterasu, the archers on the roof were no longer poised to fire, instead they were standing stock straight, looking upwards in awe. The airships had come to level over the back of the palace and they too had ceased their attack, all of them lit up by the blinding blue glow of his jutsu. This gave Sasuke great satisfaction as he flicked his fingers. The Kirin rose up into the sky with a great deal more speed than it had descended, all the way to the height it had initially appeared at. Then, with a flash, it propelled itself towards the palace and touched down just where the doors fed into the grounds. The resounding clap of thunder, and the sheer rush of energy was overwhelming as the world lit up as bright as day. Despite the blinding eruption of blue light, Sasuke was able to see soldiers tossed away as easily as dust in the wind hurled far enough away that he lost sight of them. The half-sphere that glowed for a single, overpowering moment blew away the back of the palace and the grounds themselves. And just as quickly, the light faded and the drizzle of rain resumed as the only primely noticeable sound. Sasuke looked up above the massive smoldering crater that now occupied most of what had just recently been the proving grounds for dozens upon dozens of royal soldiers, and noticed that the thunderclouds above were beginning to part, giving way to the stars. Then those stars faded to black as Sasuke's consciousness shut down and he collapsed into oblivion. No, you're not pulling your arms back far enough, you have to let them serve as your conductors, they're not just there to direct. Ong sighed as Zuko's barked instruction echoed loudly in his tired ear. They had been up since the very crack of dawn to resume his training, and Ong was having trouble keeping his eyes open. He hadn't slept well the previous night, he had dreamt of a pair of dark red eyes staring endlessly into him while he ran upon ceaseless darkness, unable to move or discern where he was. All that had been present were the eyes staring into him and provoking him with screams of agony from the person he cared most about. He had tried to find Katara in all that blackness, to try and help her and keep her from whatever pain was ailing her, but he could do nothing more than hear her. He had awoken a couple hours before sunrise and had chosen not to fall back asleep. Zuko had almost seemed to perfectly match his rising and as Ong had gone to take an early morning bathroom break, the Fire Nation prince had confronted him and stated the urgency that they continue training immediately. And so here they were now, whipping fire around themselves as the sun barely managed to peek over the top of the canyon above them. Pay attention. As Ong drifted carelessly through his motions, Zuko angrily tossed a fireball at his feet, singing his toes and making him jump back in surprise. He looked up angrily at his teacher, what's your problem? It's not my fault you decided to get us on this before anyone's even really awake. Zuko jabbed a finger in his direction. You're making excuses. You're being crazy. Just when things might have turned a shade uglier, Katara walked up the stairs to the plateau where they had been practicing. That's enough, both of you. Ong couldn't help but feel his stomach flip as it always did when he saw her, though this usually pleasant feeling was accompanied by something akin to distant dread as he remembered his dream. Hair flying about as she looked angrily between the both of them. Both Zuko and Ong immediately fell to acting like children squabbling before their mother, fingers pointing and all. He started it. We shouldn't have to be doing this this early. He's being unreasonable. This is too important to shirk. Her expression darkened and they both closed their mouths wisely. I saw the whole thing, and it doesn't take a genius to figure out what the problem is here. She walked briskly towards them, but slowed as she neared Zuko. Her face softened a fair bit and she put her hand on his shoulder. I know what you're thinking about, and I have some idea what you're feeling, but this isn't how to deal with it. If you need to talk, then let's talk, but you can't go burying your head in firebending and expect that to take all your fear away. 
Chatter seemed to have hit the nail on the head and Zuko sighed, the fight seeming to drain from him as his shoulders slumped. He looked past her to give Ong an apologetic look. And sorry, Ong Katara is right. He slowly sat himself down on the stone floor and Katara followed suit, putting an arm around his shoulder and pulling him to her. Ong felt a sudden urge to blow Zuko clean off the plateau. By now, my sister would have long since reached the capital. She would have been summoned by my father, and he would have done it. Katara squeezed his shoulder lightly. Sasuke said he was going to get to her in time. Zuko looked to her with desperate eyes. Katara, do you really believe him when he said that? I'm not great with people, but I know you are. You can read them well. And it wasn't hard for me to see the distrust you were showing towards him from the moment he arrived to the moment he left with the airship. He bowed his head and dug his finger into the stone distractedly. You don't think he's coming back, and you sure don't think he actually went to try and warn Azula. Katara seemed to think long and hard about this as Zuko continued to pick absently at the ground before speaking slowly as though afraid that she might stumble over her words and say something she didn't want to. Maybe I don't, and I hate to spoil your evaluation of me, but you've got it wrong. And terrible with people. Both Ong and Zuko looked to her, utterly bemused and she grinned at their expressions. Honestly, I'm not. I can never bring myself to trust those I inevitably find out are the most loyal people of all. And I go trusting those who ought not to be just because of a notion I get about them that I have absolutely nothing to back up. She tilted her head to the side, looking up thoughtfully. So, maybe I don't like the looks of Sasuke. I think he's dangerous, he's a pure defilement of the natural order, and I don't really want him around. But considering all the times I've been wrong, I see no reason why that couldn't happen here. Something very close to a smile touched at the corners of Zuko's mouth. I hope you'll forgive me when I say I hope you are. She smiled at him and for the second time in recent memory, Ong felt a surge of jealousy course through him. There was no time to reflect on it though as another voice joined their small congregation. Guys, 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 I need to talk to. As Soccer reached the top of the stairs, he misplaced his foot and tripped over himself, falling spectacularly to skid several feet before stopping. Unable to help himself, Ong finished Sokka's sentence for him. The ground, both Zuko and Katara laughed at his joke, but Sokka had no time for it and pushed himself furiously to his feet. This is serious, you three. Katara waved a hand at her brother as though granting permission. Please don't leave us in suspense any longer. Clearly fed up with the lack of respect he was getting, Sokka didn't waste any time. Toph's missing. This was enough to immediately put a damper on the whole affair, and Zuko and Katara got to their feet quickly, the former holding up his hands as if to try and stop himself from getting carried away too quickly. Are you sure she's missing? She said yesterday she was going to go exploring the temple's more deserted passages, and was going to be gone for a while. Sokka shook his head, his brows furrowed with worry. She would never leave for this long. I didn't see her when everyone turned in last night and no one's seen her since yesterday when we... The pieces all fell into place for the four of them at once and Ong's eyes widened. When we saw Sasuke off, Katara had a hand over her mouth. She wouldn't, spinning to look out towards the sky as though expecting to see the airship that Sasuke had departed on. Zuko shook his head. I think she might have. He turned to look back at them. Of everyone, she seemed to be the least into him, didn't trust him, didn't like the looks of him. Who's to say she didn't want to follow along and make sure he stayed in line? Sokka drew his hands through his hair, trying to rationalize what was being said. That doesn't make sense. If Sasuke had taken a path over land, then maybe. But we're talking about a small airship and flying the whole way there. It took Toph forever to get used to flying on Appa and she said she only did because she was able to trust him. She still hates flying and has that awful fear of heights. Why would she throw that aside and leave with Sasuke, and not tell us? His sister gave him a disapproving look. Wouldn't be the first time in recent memory someone's beat feet without the approval of the group. Sokka met her look with a snarky one of his own and Ong walked between them, intent on keeping the focus on Toph. Guys, come on. You guys can't go butting heads now, not when Toph's missing. Zuko walked up to stand near the three of them. What can we even do? Completely deflated by this impossible question, Ong leaned on his staff, feeling helpless once again. I don't know what about. The powerful and commanding voice of Hakoda echoed over the temple grounds then, carrying loudly as he relayed a very pertinent piece of information. Airship on the horizon. I repeat, airship on the horizon. The four of them exchanged looks and without another word, they sprinted for the stairs. Zuko hadn't even been thinking about how it was going to feel, no matter the outcome. As he climbed aboard Appa alongside Ong, Katara and Sokka, all that mattered to him was that he was going to know. He was going to see the result of whatever had occurred the previous night. He wasn't considering possibilities, the potential cases that may have arisen. 
He just had to know. Appa soared out from under the canyon to land above in the grassy field where they had seen Sasuke off the previous day. The airship was already touched down, the maroon of its coloration clashing with the swaying bright green of the grass that almost seemed to shine on its own with the morning sun. And as Zuko nearly fell off Appa in a heap in his desperation to talk to Sasuke, and as what had happened, the world seemed to draw to a sudden standstill. Because Zuko wasn't looking at Sasuke. He was looking at his sister. He stared into her perpetually hateful eyes that seemed to glow of an emotion he didn't think he had ever seen in Azula before. Her royal garb had burns and strips of it missing and her usually well-kept hair was down around her shoulders being tossed in the wind. It looked as though she had just been through a war. Zuko, get back, was all he heard before Sokka took his sister's command to heart and wrapped his arms around Zuko's chest, dragging him backwards as Ong and Katara rushed past him to adopt defensive stances. Azula simply regarded them as Katara snapped at her. I'm not sure what it is you've been told, but you're not welcome here. Zuko struggled against Sokka's grip. Katara, wait, don't. He wasn't paid any mind as Ong added his thoughts to the situation. If Sasuke really brought you back here, he's even more dangerous than I thought. Azula looked between the both of them before pointing a thumb over her shoulder. Sasuke had nothing to do with it. She's the one who told us where you were. Two more people exited the airship and Zuko's heart did a furious backflip. Mai walked down the ramp, carrying Toph in her arms. The relief Zuko felt at seeing the both of them was quickly overrun with anger at seeing what appeared to be wounds on both of their bodies, Toph looking the worse for wear. Katara let out a short cry at the sight and rushed to them, all confrontational motivation thrown aside. As she reached Mai, she looked down, eyes wide as Ong cautiously walked up behind her. What happened? She shouted towards Azula who didn't so much as look at her, but spoke, not addressing anyone in particular. The royal guard attacked us as we tried to leave. Toph and Mai both were hit with arrows. As though brought back by the talking over her, Toph grunted and shifted in Mai's arm before rolling out of them to land shakily on the ground. I'm fine, but Katara you need to get on the airship. Tai Lee got hit real bad. Zuko's head reeled. All three of them are here. Katara rushed up the ramp without a word and Ong took her place in front of Toph. He looked to struggle for a good moment as to what to say before frowning. That was a very dumb thing to do. In her usual show of affection, she punched him in the stomach and he doubled over, coughing. Good to see you too, twinkle toes. As the both of them shared a gentle embrace as to not stress her wounds further, Zuko finally shook himself free from Sokka who had more or less given up on holding him and was looking himself quite like he was trying to wrap his head around the situation. Zuko closed the distance halfway between Mai and his sister, entirely unsure himself of what to say. Mai broke the silence for him. You look better since becoming a traitor. Her smile was enough to draw one of his own across his face. He shrugged off her joke with one of his own. I have to wonder if that won't apply similarly to you. Considering. He trailed off and they both looked to Azula who still wasn't looking at anyone. She spoke with the same flat intonation he always had remembered hearing. But the telltale smirk was long gone from the corners of her mouth. Don't assume this changes anything between us, Zuko. Father's attempt on my life has only emboldened by belief that the Fire Nation must take control of the Four Nations. She very clearly struggled on the next few words. Under new leadership if necessary. Nearly unable to believe what he was hearing, Zuko looked weakly back to Mai. What happened? Before she could reply to him, Katara shouted from the other side of the burner aboard the airship. Zuko, Sokka, I need your hands. Noting the urgency in her voice, Zuko raced up the ramp behind Sokka who was clearly happy for something to do. Tai Lee was a brutal sight. She had clearly taken a very intense firebolt to the shoulder, and the resulting damage had spread across her upper body on the side where the attack had impacted. It wasn't hard to tell that. At its point, the fire had punched clean through her body, skin, muscle and all. Zuko swallowed and stared at his childhood friend as Katara looked her over with a swift eye. Are, are you going to be able to help her? Katara's face was grim, but determined. I'll try, but we need to get her down to a stable water source. I need you both to carry her and get her aboard Appa. We'll take her down as quick as we can. Sokka muttered to himself as he walked to Tai Lee's other side. She tries to kill us a hundred times and now we're going to try and save her life not like Princess Homicide literally isn't also here no, makes sense. Sokka, he raised his hands, yeah, yeah, I got it. All right, Zuko, on three. They lifted her carefully from the floor of the airship and carried her off towards Appa. But it was not lost on Zuko that Katara was staring intently at the last passenger aboard, who Sokka had missed completely, eyes closed and leaning against the burner. And despite his wildly mixed feelings, Zuko couldn't help but feel the tugs of gratitude towards the resting Sasuke. 
He dreamt and remembered. Names and relationships still danced outside his reach, but he saw who he had been, who he was, and what he had done. He saw the bodies of his parents and the cold face of his brother. He saw his childhood smashed to pieces and all his naivety dashed to the wayside. He watched himself grow and train with a single purpose in mind, a purpose that took him away from everything else, friends, happiness, life itself. A drive was all he had and all he needed. He saw himself abandon any chance for peace and confront his brother and finally take his revenge. And he saw the agony that had flooded him upon realizing what his brother had truly hidden away. How his actions had ultimately been for a blind goal, with nothing past it and nothing between. He felt the pain that had ravaged him those days and while nothing told him how he had come to leave that life and be here, he found himself occupied with quite enough. There was nothing he could remember beyond the barest outline. But it was all still there, the particulars didn't even seem to matter much anymore. He dreamt and wished he hadn't remembered, wished he couldn't remember. Katara had to remind herself to let her arms come uncrossed occasionally to keep them falling asleep, but she found that such a stance was all she could really manage given their current company. She sat around a fire, with Ong and Sokka to her left and right, Azula and Maya across from them with Toph and Zuko sitting between the two groups on the other edge of their circle. Katara was still struggling very hard to make sense of what had happened. After they had brought Tai Lee down for treatment, she had worked meticulously for several hours with the aid of her father and Ong, the former because of his experience with wartime wounds and the latter due to his waterbending. Following the assurance that she would just need rest to recover appropriately, that had turned her attention to Toph, Mayan, very reluctantly Azula. The first two had only been sporting arrow wounds which had been treatable enough, but Azula had taken a nasty hit to the center of her back and had taken more time. Katara had found healing the princess's wounds less than desirable work, and judging by the look that had occupied Azula's face when she had been forced to bear her back to Katara's bending, she had been no fan either. Katara had been surprised though when she had worked on Toph and Mai. Their arrow wounds had been very lightly cauterized, with a very delicate touch to stop bleeding and potential infection, and to her knowledge, there had only been one person aboard that airship awake who could have performed this care. Azula, caring about anyone I'd sooner believe Appa can prepare fine dining. Now, they were doing their best to come to terms with what had happened, to get everything out in the open. Mai and Toph had done most of the talking, with Katara or Sokka occasionally interjecting with a question. Ong remained as silent as Azula did, though Katara could tell his mind was racing. The story that was regaled was a doozy, even by Team Avatar standards. Sasuke's ridiculous plan of skydiving through a storm, Fire Lord Ozai's ultimate betrayal of his own flesh, and blood, and the dramatic escape that had followed were so engrossing that Katara found on more than one occasion that she needed to remind herself just who they were sitting across from. Wait, so I'm sorry, Sokka interjected as Mai spoke of the difficulty getting the airship prepared while being fervently assaulted by the royal guard. How exactly did you get out of there if there really were, as you put it, hundreds of soldiers? Mai massaged the area that Katara had touched up with her healing and said almost absently, Sasuke blew them up with a lightning dragon. There was an appropriate pause as those who hadn't witnessed the feet gaped. Toph turned her head in Mai's direction. Wait, that's what happened. Mai gave her a look. Yeah, I suppose not being able to see probably made that whole sequence of events a little confusing. Toph shrugged and looked at her feet. I just knew we were getting hammered with arrows and fireballs. I was just trying to protect the ship when I got hit. I remember it getting very warm and I heard Sasuke yell something before it got really hot and really loud. I passed out for a while once we got cruising after that. Katara shook her head and looked down as well, trying to grapple with her feelings towards Sasuke. He was absent from the campfire as well, resting in a different room within the temple, separate from the one Tai Lee was recovering in, at Azula's request. He hadn't been badly hurt, in fact, considering that he had taken on what might have been a sizable chunk of the royal army, and the Fire Lord to boot, his condition was rather miraculous. Whatever he had done this dragon he summoned made. Whatever it was must have been enough to take him out. Ong piped up for the first time since the story had begun. When you say dragon what do you mean? Mai shook her head as she clearly tried to recall details. It's hard to say, we were all so caught up, I don't really know. Once moment though, the storm clouds above us sort of seemed to spiral, and the lightning all glowed towards the center of it. I remember seeing Sasuke then holding up his hand and then that spiral opened up in the middle and a dragon shaped entirely by lightning came down. It floated around long enough for everyone to get a good look at it, and then, like Toph says, Sasuke yelled something and it just flew up and smashed into the back of the palace. Blew every soldier, every guard, every sharpshooter clean away like they were nothing. She snapped to emphasize her point before turning to Ong. 
To answer what I think you're asking though, no, I don't think it was an actual dragon. More like something he crafted with the lightning in order to wield it. She rested her forearms on her knees, hands clasped tightly together. It was big. I really couldn't believe what I was seeing. Azula's made some pretty impressive stuff with her lightning. But this it was like he was controlling the storm itself. Seeming to remember something, she added, after the dragon touched down and Sasuke passed out, the clouds just seemed to dissipate. The biggest storm we've ever seen at the capital, and it just disperses. I think he drained it or something. Katara considered this as Sokka prodded, then. My gestured around her. Then that's about it. Toph woke up a few minutes later and told us where you were hidden out. I knew where the air temple was so I was able to get us over some hours later. She finished rather anticlimactically, and the weight of the story settled in. Sokka blew out a long few and put his hands behind his head. Wowza. Well, I have to say, for all of Zuko's insisting, I never would have guessed anything would come of this. Turning her piercing gaze towards him, Mai asked, What do you mean? Realizing they had a part of their own story to tell, Katara decided to be open about this particular bit. She had no intention of getting too friendly with any of the three Fire Nation women who had joined them in recent hours, but this was hardly something they needed to hide. Sasuke's first memories of our world began in a fire temple the Fire Lord visited some weeks ago. He recalls briefly waking up there and being bested by Ozai where he then found himself waking to being a prisoner at Boiling Rock and from there, well, I think you know a chunk of his story. Katara was surprised to see the dark looks cross over both Mai and Azula's faces at this remark and she coughed somewhat awkwardly before continuing. After the prison escape, they came back here and he was able to remember hearing about some ritual that Ozai was looking into, something about Sazen. Zuko spoke up, the ritual of Sazen's rites. She nodded in his direction. Yes, that. There were some writings here in the air temple that, while not giving a ton of specifics, outlined basic practices and teachings of other nations. Through this, we were able to find that Ozai intended to kill Azula, based mostly on deduction. While she talked, she paid careful attention to both Mai and Azula. Mai was listening attentively, but Azula was frustratingly impossible to read. She had been sitting as rigid as a statue since they had sat down. Her only words since they had come down to the temple being a snarky remark about the state of the place and requesting that Tai Li not be placed in the same room as Sasuke. Other than that, she had been entirely silent and was not staring perpetually to her right, looking flat into the wall as though expecting it to make a more conversational partner. Upon coming down with Tai Li and sending Appa back up for the others, Katara had rushed about before beginning the healing process, ordering Chit Sang to take the kids and Haru and move to another part of the temple grounds. Her father she had no choice in showing, but she didn't want anyone else near Azula, but the general aura that the princess was giving off was very odd. Her antisocial tendencies towards them notwithstanding, she had composed herself very differently from the last time Katara had seen her. She seemed two seconds away from exploding into a rage, but her eyes seemed to say that said rage would burn out as quickly as it began. She had no interest in Aum, the person she had been hunting for months and had little reaction to seeing her sworn enemies. Ultimately, Katara saw defeat in Azula's eyes and more than that, a sense that she was entirely lost. She didn't seem very aware of her surroundings, only seeming to hear certain things and her movements were sporadic and flinching, and Katara truly wasn't sure which version of Azula she found more worrying. Toph continued in her place as she cut off a moment, looking anxiously at Azula, waiting for any sign of life. Zuko started off about how he couldn't just let his sister walk into the slaughter like that without at least a warning and how he needed to go back and yada, yada. We were trying to convince him not to try some crazy mission to save his sister who wanted him just as dead as the Fire Lord did mind you, when Sasuke walked up and said he'd go and deliver the message. She dug her bare toes into the ground, a common habit of hers. I think most of us weren't sure what to think, but we sent him off anyway. Anything to keep Zuko training on, I guess. I didn't believe that he was going to the capital and I snuck aboard and well, you heard that part of the story on. Mai took this all in before sitting back with a thoughtful look before flicking her gaze up. So, Sasuke. What's his deal? What's he after? Sokka, Ong and Katara exchanged looks, clearly looking for the best course of action to take for this rather dubious line of questioning. Katara could see Zuko opening his mouth, clearly ready to tell all to the woman he fancied as his girlfriend and she spoke over him. We don't know. He claims that he's here to help Ong defeat the Fire Lord, and that doing so will help bring back his memory. Holding up a hand, Mai looked between them all. Wait, he has memory loss. Sokka nodded. Everything before his run-in with all Ozai, dust in the wind. Mai nodded slowly, clearly taking this in. Katara could tell she had very mixed feelings on Sasuke as she did herself. 
When Mai finally spoke, she seemed distantly impressed. He's one of the best firebenders I've ever seen. In regards to pure power, I've never seen anything like it. Ong opened his mouth and Katara, having a pretty good idea what he was going to reveal, put a hand on his thigh and dug her nails into him as much as she dared. He tightened in pain, but got the hint and slammed his mouth shut. It seemed an odd thing to keep reserved, but opening up about Sasuke's true array of abilities hardly seemed necessary, especially after all the ground they had just covered. Seeming to sense a lull, Mai stretched, wincing. Well, if we're done for now, anyone know a spot a girl could get a nap? Zuko stood up so fast that he nearly fell over as he moved to help Mai. As the pair of them moved towards the innards of the temple, Sokka whispered to Katara, I think I'll go and keep an eye on them. She replied with a small smile, careful you don't see more than you bargained for. His cheeks flushed and he rose to his feet to follow Zuko and Mai at a respectable distance. Toph got to her feet then. I'm going to check on Sasuke and Tai Li. Katara had kept her eyes locked on Azula and she spoke pointedly to Ong as her gaze didn't shift. Ong, why don't you go with her? He turned to her with an air of confusion. Me. Why would? She turned her eyes down for a single moment and was able to transfer her insistence in just that one second. Ong jumped to his feet rather as Zuko had. Yep, no, great idea, awesome, really. He might have continued to look incredibly conspicuous if Toph hadn't dragged him off then. Somehow, she was better at reading a room than anyone Katara knew. As the footsteps faded away, Katara found that she had gotten what she wanted, but also felt a great rise in anxiety as being alone with Azula was hardly cause for celebration. Relax, she's not going to try anything, why would she? Azula surprised her then by being the first of them to talk, the first words she had uttered since they had sat down. Whatever you're going to ask, do so. I'd rather be left alone, but I can tell you've got something on your mind. Katara found it very easy then to throw aside her apprehension as her usual feelings for Azula came rolling back in. This despicable girl, even in the state she was in, still condescending, still demanding, still infuriating to no end it was all Katara could do to try and keep from raising her voice. Just because some of ours saved you, don't think that makes you welcome here. When Tai Li has recovered, we'll have a proper sit down about what's to be done about you and your lot. At last, Azula turned to meet Katara's eyes, her gaze dark and penetrating. Oh, what an adorable idea. Is that really all you do when we're not on your tail? Sit around and talk. No wonder the Avatar is still so unprepared to meet my father. You're all too busy forming committees then to actually accomplish anything. Her biting voice was enough to knock Katara into silence for a moment. How could she have expected anything different? No matter the situation, Azula was Azula, still a stunted and vile person. Keeping down a snapping reply, Katara tried to approach it somewhat more diplomatically. We will consider your circumstances obviously. Having your own father try to kill you would be hard on anyone, even you. She couldn't keep that particular comment to herself and silently cursed herself as she watched Azula raise an eyebrow in acceptance of her accidental challenge. The princess rose to her feet, crossing her arms in a mirror of Katara's own stance. I don't need your pity, and I don't need some half-assed psychoanalysis. Don't think that just because of what I endured I'm not still entirely loyal to my nation. If my father has deemed the only way to move forward is killing me, I will pursue the advancement of the Fire Nation in my own way. Katara wasn't able to hold back now. Then why not just go to him and kneel like the slave you are? I noticed when Mai was talking about your meeting the Fire Lord, any detail of your reaction to his desire were pretty absent. Almost as though she didn't want to say that if she and Tai Li hadn't been there, you would have just let yourself die then and there. Azula said nothing and Katara drove on. For all that you command and for all the people you view as beneath you, you've never once stopped to think for yourself, have you? Forever your father's puppet. This seemed to snap something in Azula's restraint and in a flash, the two of them were nose to nose. Don't speak to me of puppets. All you people are doing are blindly clinging to some prophecy that the Avatar will be in balance. If you had any brains about you instead of blind faith, you would have gone after my father months ago. But no, one failed attempt in its hide until the last possible second before Sazen's comet arrives. And what will you do, your highness? Katara snapped back. Wait for someone else to do the work for you and then swoop in for the throne. Not so confident without the army you inherited at your back is it? Azula laughed then, a harsh and ringing sound. You're a farce, waterbender. I can see it in your eyes, all you are is scared. She turned away and walked towards a deserted part of the temple before stopping and throwing a last remark over her shoulder. Oh, and saying that it was Zuko's idea to have me rescued. If you're going to lie about anything, I think you could stand to try a little harder. The princess resumed walking haughtily away. Come get me when Tai Li is awake. Until then, please don't bother me with that superiority complex you're hiding behind. 
As the princess stalked off, Katara stood shaking for a moment, quite unable to form words before finally shouting after her, Superiority complex. Are you serious? Azula seemed to be done with their brief confrontation however and had already disappeared into the depths of the upper temple. Puffing, Katara resisted the childish urge to stomp her foot before spinning to go check on her patience. As she descended the stairs however, disbelieving laugh escaped her throat as she reflected on the fact that they were now sharing a living space with three women who had done everything in their power to kill them and capture Ong for months. I'd say stranger things have happened but I'm really not sure they have. Gossip, as in any part of the world, was just as powerful a phenomenon in the Fire Nation capital as it would have been anywhere else. When a singular merchant spoke to his friends how he had seen a dragon descend from the storm clouds the previous evening and attack the royal palace, he had been met with initial eye rolling, but pieces of reality began to slowly give credence to his claim. Firstly, the storm the previous night had been truly remarkable, and for it to have been brought about by supernatural forces might not have been far-fetched. Secondly, there had supposedly been several bodies that were being cleaned up late in the night, lying around the palace walls as though they had fallen from the wall all at once. And with the palace being on total lockdown since the storm, with not even the regular suppliers allowed inside, the assumption that something very odd had indeed happened began to spread throughout the capital. From those passing one another in the streets, to family members taking the words home, the stories spread and flourished. It was in a popular tavern that one of the merchant's friends seized the opportunity to take the spotlight when he heard the stories being passed amongst his fellow regulars. He leapt onto a table and began to regale an exaggerated version of the story he had heard just that morning, very sure to include the dragon that had been the climatic detail. The dozens of patrons watched him intently, but by the end, most were rolling their eyes and laughing at this mystery dragon, a species that hadn't been seen alive in many years. But as they returned to their drinks, many of them felt the inkling of doubt creeping in their guts. The merchant's friend, happy with his brief glory, took to the streets as night fell, sufficiently satisfied and buzzed. Had he not been so high on his own success, he might have noticed that a figure, one who had been tucked away in the corner of the tavern out of sight, had followed him. As he passed by an alley, he had been lifted cleanly off his feet and thrown against the wall of the alley, away from the eyes of anyone else walking those streets that late. Immediately, the merchant's friend fell into a slurred babble. Look, buddy, you don't want any trouble. I don't even got much money on me, and my friend's a firebender, heel. The figure's tone was low and overpowering, plenty enough to cut off the man's rambling. A dragon came from the storm, you said. Why? The figure pulled the man away from the wall and slammed him into it again with renewed intensity. Your story. The dragon, catching on and coughing in pain, the merchant's friend waved his hand desperately. Yeah, that's what he told me. Bright blue dragon, said it could have been made from lightning itself, and it attacked the palace. I'm just telling you what I heard. And it sort of makes sense, they closed off all roads around the palace and no one's allowed inside. There was talk they were cleaning up some bodies, Cash Rien got beat up by some soldiers for talking about it at the market today. This was seemingly all the stranger needed to hear and he dropped the man heavily to the ground who reached as his assaulter walked away. He would pass out in that alley shortly thereafter, but got sight of the stranger's odd garb before he lapsed into unconsciousness, quite the odd black cloak with red clouds decorating it. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 3. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Also check out the story and author Blutus Mindpretzel on fanfiction.net. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.